welcome to one of the most exciting pieces of programming that I think Africa.com has ever done. And that is today's International Women's Day feature, what women CEOs in Africa need to know about artificial intelligence. I couldn't be any more excited about this event. Um, I think that what we wanna do for Women's Day is not to linger in the negative space and the tremendous work that needs to be done. And there is a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done. And we will talk about some of that this morning in our panel discussion on bias in AI. But what we want to do is to celebrate the success of women. And it starts today with the second annual Africa.com definitive list of women CEOs, which we will be announcing today. And as many of you know, this is the um, first of its kind list of women running big business in Africa based off of data that is provided by Bloomberg. So in the course of today's session, in addition to equipping the CEOs with information needed to run organizations on AI, we will be revealing who the 74 women are on our list. Um, in addition to that, I want to thank right now my friend and colleague, Kara Malkani, without whom today would not have been possible. Um, Kara, professor at Harvard Business School, um, I'll talk a little bit more about him later, but he has been a tremendous partner in this journey. Also the person who uh, was an anchor along with Tarun Khanna and Kerry Elkins in Africa Live, which some of you who are joining us today will have participated in, as you know, a big experiment on bringing executive education for entrepreneurs to Africa. So I thank you very much, Karim, and I will thank you some more. Today, I'd like to tell you who's in the audience with you. We have 62 countries represented, 34 countries across the African continent, and 28 countries from, a rest, from the rest of the world. As you can see, pretty much every continent is included here. Maybe Antarctica is left off, um, but we certainly have a lot from the US, from Europe, from Latin America, from Asia, from Australia. Um, thank you all for being part of this event today. I want to tell you who specifically is in the audience with you today. Um, first, I'd like to give a very warm welcome to the 74 women, most of whom are here, the members of the definitive list of African women CEOs for 2022. They just received notice last week that they had made this list and most of them are here. So a very warm welcome. This was designed with you in mind and the rest of us are here along for the journey. We have 3000 registrants today joining us on Zoom and a large number joining us on Facebook. 38% of today's audience is male based on your registration data, which I think speaks to, um, well, who you are, as well as hopefully the quality of our program, which isn't just for women. Um, we want the men CEOs on the continent to uh, get ahead of the game as far as AI is concerned. We thank you for joining us. 57% of the people who have joined us today have a C-suite title, CEO, CFO, CMO, et cetera. And you can see that the um, sectors that are most represented are financial services, technology, agriculture, and healthcare. We also have 230 academics with us registered today um, from a wide range of, univer of universities. Uh, with our faculty colleagues, you wouldn't, are not surprised that we have a large number from Harvard, but we also have ones from across the continent, Wits, University of Cape Town, University of Lagos, Ibadan, Strathmore, River State. We have people from all across the world, University of Delhi, and from China, we have the North China University of Technology and Tsinghua University. We also have 114 NGO registrants from the UN, the Tony Lumelu Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Ernest Oppenheimer Foundation, Legal Resources Center, and Afro Labs. We thank all of you for being here today. We want to tell you that this is one of the two initiatives that we have underway for Women's Month. Um, we will be having on the 23rd of October, the Women Heads of State Initiative, which is also another incredibly exciting and dynamic program where we are convening for the first time the 22 women who have served as head of state, defined as a president or prime minister in Africa. And five of those women will be joining us uh, for that event, where we will be looking at the top six opportunities for Africa's advancement through the gender lens of women who have run African countries. So please, you will be receiving emails about that. Um, equally exciting, and we hope that you will be with us as we do that for the first time. Look at the women. No one has ever brought together all of the women who have run a, a, a country in the African continent. And so again, groundbreaking work that we're incredibly excited to be a part of. Today, I also want to extend a special welcome to the senior executives and staff of Standard Bank. 
Standard Bank is not just a sponsor of this work, but they are deeply engaged. I want to thank Sil Gabusa, Kate Johns, and Laura Noyce in particular, and they have extended this invitation to their colleagues across Standard Bank. We actually have several hundred um, Standard Bank registrants for today. So we thank all of you from Standard Bank for not just donating, but for being a part of this. We're going to have our special moment in history today. It is Women's History Day, Women's uh, International Women's Day, and we're going to have our historical moment. Um, Dorothy Terrell is widely considered to be one of the first, if not the first, Black woman to have a management role in the tech industry. In 1984, she was the first Black woman to serve as a plant manager in the tech industry for DEC Digital, which at that time in the 19. 80s was one of the largest American corporations with over 140,000 employees. She went on to a very successful career in the tech industry. She served at, Micro, at Sun Microsystems, where she was a president of Sun Express. She's continued on with a very successful career across many industries and has made contributions through much of the work that she has done in addition to serving the tech industry. She's an investor and very involved philanthropically. And Dorothy is with us today. And so we'd like to thank you, Dorothy, for taking the time from your busy schedule to be here with us. And we honor you for the legacy. All of the women that we are discussing, working with today in the tech industry stand on the shoulders of pioneers like you. So thank you very much, Dorothy. As we move into the particular conversation we're having today on artificial intelligence, uh, this is an area that just keeps growing. And just recently, as you can see, within the last month, um, the Brookings Institute put out an interesting report about how artificial intelligence is now creeping into the African battlefield. And here's a fantastic photo of a ranger in Kenya who is now using AI to protect uh, the bush in Kenya against poachers. So AI is taking on new roles, and you will hear from all of our experts today on a variety of sectors, but I thought I would just let you know that beyond what we planned, um, there are new uses for AI across Africa emerging every day. And so now I'd like to talk about our partner here today, um, Karim Lakani, who is a professor at Harvard Business School, has been a true partner in the creation of today's event. He has helped us recruit um, speakers and has just been a partner in every way and um, shape and form. He's the author of Competing in the Age of AI, a true expert in this space, and we are particularly privileged that he has put all of his energy, his resources, his relationships and contacts into making today what it is for the audience. So thank you very much for being here. The other thing that Karim did, in addition to bringing um, all of the outside experts, he also brought with him his colleague from Harvard Business School, Sadal Neely. Sadal is the author of the book about to be published, The Digital Mindset, What It Really Takes to Thrive in the Age of Data and Algorithms and AI. This is available on Amazon and um, will be coming out in May. And so we invite you to um, look at her book and you know, just be thankful that we have some of the world's greatest expertise on the intersection between business and artificial intelligence with us today and driving the agenda and the content that we're about to present. And lastly, I'd like to thank our sponsors without whom this wouldn't be possible, Standard Bank and Visa. Thank you very much to both of you for your contributions to this event. And our first session is going to be on bias. Yes, that algorithm is, is biased. And so, Karen, I'm going to invite you to join us for this conversation. And, and as we start off, I'd like to share with the audience a video that um, we think really is, is very creative. Um, Joy Bolomini is at the MIT Media Lab, and she has taken the speech given by the American slave Sojourner Truth called Ain't I a Woman? And she has set it to her own poetry in order to tell the story of how facial recognition is biased, biased against blacks and women. And we think that it's a great way for us to launch this conversation um, because it's just so enjoyable. And we thank you very much, Joy, for allowing us to roll this video um, as an intro to this conversation.
My heart smiles as I bask in their legacies, knowing their lives have altered many destinies. In her eyes, I see my mother's poise. In her face, I glimpse my auntie's grace. In this case of deja vu, a 19th century question comes into view. In a time when Sojourner Truth asked, ain't I a woman? Today we pose this question to new powers, making bets on artificial intelligence, hope towers. The Amazonians peek through windows blocking deep blues as faces increment scars. Old burns, new urns, collecting data chronicling our past, often forgetting to deal with gender, race, and class. Again I ask, ain't I a woman? Face by face the answers seem uncertain, young and old, proud icons are dismissed. Can machines ever see my queens as I view them? Can machines ever see our grandmothers as we knew them? Ida B. Wells, data science pioneer, hanging facts, stacking stats on the lynching of humanity, teaching truths hidden in data, each entry and omission, a person worthy of respect. Shirley Chisholm, unbought and unbossed, the first black congresswoman, but not the first to be misunderstood by machines well-versed in data-driven mistakes. Michelle Obama, unabashed and unafraid to wear her crown of history, yet her crown seems a mystery to systems unsure of her hair. A wig, a buffant, a toupee, maybe not. Are there no words for our braids and our locks? Does relaxed hair and sunny skin make Oprah the first lady? Even for her face well known, some algorithms fault her. Echoing sentiments that strong women are men. We laugh, celebrating the successes of our sisters with Serena smiles. No label is worthy of our beauty. I think that's a, way, a great way to kick off this conversation. And why don't I just take a moment to introduce the panelists. We have Karam Lakani, who I've introduced already, and he's going to moderate this, and I will be joining him in that conversation. And we really want this to be just a robust, we, we sort of think of this conversation like The View. You know, we get a bunch of interesting people together who have tremendous expertise, and we want all of you to be involved in this conversation. So the four speakers that we have today are Teki Akute, who is the founder and executive director of the Africa Digital Rights Hub, also an ICT and telecom lawyer. Welcome, Teki. We've got Faye Firth Butterfield, who is the head of artificial intelligence and machine learning at the World Economic Forum. Kay, we're very grateful to have you with us today. Then we have Dr. Rana El Kaliubi. Rana is an AI thought leader, machine learning scientist, and she's the author of Girl Decoded. She's also the deputy CEO at SmartEye, Rana, thank you so much for being with us today. And lastly, we have Ati and Gubavena. Ati is the group executive and digital progress re-engineering at Vodacom. So Ati, thank you. What a fantastic lineup to take on this topic of bias in AI. Karam, over to you. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, thank you all to jo for joining us. Um, you know, uh, that video always sends me chills because it is so, so powerful and just tells us uh, the state of the world. And in many ways, it can seem abstract, like you're seeing, you know, uh, some back end algorithms de de detecting for us, you know, genders of, of African 
women. Uh, but in many ways, the AI world is already with us, with all of us and what we do with our smartphones. Already, if you're using a smartphone, much of your interactions with the world, your contacts is mediated through AI, whether we know it or not. And as I thought about this video, the first question I wanted to sort of ask uh, from, from our panelists, and we'll start with Techie. Techie, what is your sense? I mean, this video is a few years old. Uh, Joy really brought this question uh, to the fore about sort of gender and racial bias in the algorithms used by the large technology giants. What do you see today uh, in terms of this question, uh, both in the continent, but also worldwide? Thank you very much, Karim, and thank you, Theresa, for um, you know asking me to join you. And uh, congratulations to all the wonderful uh, women CEOs across Africa. Um, the the issue of, of bias will never go away, even today. Um, I, I know the earlier beginnings of some of these discussions started in 2016 with Beauty AI, if a lot of you are familiar, was one of the first AI tools that you know fully judged um, a number of women across the world between the ages of 18 and I believe 29 on, on the context of some standards that have been used to establish beauty. Interestingly, the, the results were stunning out of the 44 women of the over 6,000 women that were judged by these algorithmic tools, only 44 of them were judged as meeting the world standard of beauty. And this was a tool that was developed to be very fair. And out of the 44, only majority were Europeans, only a handful of um, Asians, and then there was only one person of dark skin in there. And it raised a lot of controversies and questions even back in 2016. Interestingly, the chief officer of, of Beauty AI that brought out this tool mentioned, you know, said something that is still the challenge we have today. He said that, look, if we're training these AI tools, we train them based on information that we have. And so if we do not input enough data into the system, then obviously we're building these biases. And, and I think it is even more strong when it comes to the African continent and African women. Uh, just last Saturday, I was talking about um, open data and the kind of data ecosystem that exists across Africa. And so the, there is a very real challenge that we are facing, especially around algorithmic bias. And, and I think that that has not gone away even though we have recognized it and there has been maybe some kind of improvements. It's also interesting to see the highlight of the video tagging mostly African women as male, you know. And, and you know, I have always been an ardent believer that, you know, technology is not the solution to all problems. If you input garbage in technology, you will get garbage out. And, and I think I just want to sign off with that. I'll probably come back to talk about, you know, concrete things that we can do to really address some of these challenges that we face with these technologies. Thank you, Taki. It's so, so helpful. And, and just to highlight one part that I think is very important is that many of these large technology firms take data that's already out on the internet. So if we don't generate our own data and put on the internet, it's not going to get sucked up. And that's part of the problem that we're facing. Athi, your hand is up. Athi, your perspective on this. Well, thank you for that, Karim. I think it's just to add to take his comment, right, about the data sources for me is one thing, right? You could have credible data sources. And I think it reminds me of a situation where one of my friends, when we were doing the MBA, was referring to a, a, a collection from our the biggest township in South Africa. And all the information they collected was about consumption patterns based on the, it, the household incomes. And the outcome of that was that the majority of the, the income in those households in that area predominantly spend their income on food and they least pay on education, right? 
So this team, very credible company also, collecting this data, came to present to the ex goal in terms of what kind of products to potentially position in that particular township. So they highlighted how, as we all know, African people love food, which is why then the predominantly spending money on the on on the income on food, and that it, it as you can see in society, they they hardly invest in education, and this is now evident right in their income and expenditure. And she was an African female who grew up in that in that township, and she stopped the presentation midway, and she said, "Can you guys appreciate the income?" inequality that exists in South Africa as they start. And therefore a loaf of bread is say $1, doesn't matter where you live and what your income is, right? Mm -hmm. And also when you look at the dynamics of these, the demographics of the people that live in this township, they, they get state funding from an education perspective in the university space, but um, lower so, um, what high school and primary school is relatively free. Right, so therefore you cannot compare them to the suburbs who invest in private education and university. So I think what, what we started talking about there in, in, in our conversation is how, because she was sitting in a position of power, one, and she was the only black female in, in that group of people that were in that, in that boardroom at the time, she was able to question the interpretation of that data. So now we're not even questioning the source because it literally came from the people that are in the township. But how we got interpreted was completely misunderstood. Um, what she was then highlighting to her team, right, that if she, she wasn't in the room, they would have gone off on a tangent in terms of product development because there was a lack of understanding and the misinterpretation of the data. And that's where I then realized how bias can be further automated through the lack of diversity whether diversity in the in the teams that collect the data, yes. the decision makers who could be there to question the kind of data that exists, then results in us producing products that can't be consumed effectively because we were there's a whole narrative about data led decisions, right? So yes. the expo was led by the data, so they we couldn't even fault the data at the time. So now it begs the question about the people that are decision makers in the boardrooms. How much do they understand of the data collection process and therefore the interpretation? And if, we, if we've got boardrooms filled with middle-aged white men, right, they all grew up in the same area, went to the same schools. What then does it even mean for their bottom line if yeah. they lack diversity? Thank so you. Archie. That's great. Yeah. Nice no, and I think, I think, yeah, I think what you're presenting again is another cr critical element is that as more and more of these algorithms get productionized and become part of the ways in which we run our companies and our organizations, the decision-making about which algorithms go alive, how they go live is now an executive responsibility, right? And so that executive responsibility, the executives need to understand who's there at the table, what, who's missing from the table, and have, do we even have the right predictions? Because the algorithms in many ways don't feel anything, they just do. They just make a prediction or they recognize patterns. Kay, what's your perspective on this? Going back to the points that have just been made, the World Economic Forum did a survey a couple of years ago that showed only 22% of people coding AI, creating AI, were women. And that's much, much fewer um, people are sort of from, um, from places in the world that are not Western or um, Asian. And so, you know, that immediately shows you the problem. And what we know is that this bias partly comes from the attitudes that people bring, as we've just been hearing, to when they actually create the algorithms. So one of the ways that we've been talking about doing that and that we found that successful companies sort that out is by actually bringing other people into the team. So you might not be able to get women coders, but you probably will be able to get women social scientists, women from the humanities. And by bringing those people in at that time, not only do you um, help with the gender bias, but you should also bring different populations to that table as well. But also you can um, 
you can actually make the algorithm better for your customers because it's a sort of business decision or it should be a business decision. You want this algorithm to serve the customers and that's part of your brand. So it should be a business decision, but it's also part of whether it's going to be successful or not. And so I think that that's a really important thing for any anybody from business listening to this. Um, bias is bad for your business. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, also extend this to, you know, we're now seeing alpha code, for example. Um, so we're seeing algorithms really good at um, solving problems and, um, and creating code. But if you haven't got it right at the very beginning, all you're doing is perpetuating the problem. And then to the point that was just made about C-suite and board, um, we have actually created uh, toolkits for boards and C-suites to think so that they can actually think about what it takes to use AI properly in their businesses. So I hope that they'll be useful tools. I'd like to come back at face, on facial recognition if we have a chance, but I want to give Rana an opportunity to say something too. Yeah, so Rana, you know, it's interesting, Rana, Rana built a company called, uh, about emotional <laughs> uh, AI. So Rana, give us your experience on, on this question and uh, what you did in your company and what you see as the current state as well. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you again, Teresa and Kareem for having me here. Um, and happy Women's International Day, everybody. Um, yeah, I've spent the last 20 plus years building essentially technology that can recognize human faces and infer human emotions and facial expressions. And so Joy's video really hits home um, for me and for the work I do. Um, the way I like to think about it is, and actually I believe like data and algorithmic bias is one of the biggest problems we have in AI. It's not that AI is going to take over and machines are going to destroy humanity. It's like we're going to destroy ourselves because we're not being intentional about solving this problem around bias. So it starts with the data. The data has to be absolutely diverse and it's not going to be diverse on, unless we're intentional about it being diverse. So we spend you know, a lot of time and a lot of money ensuring that the faces we, you know, we, we've amassed over 12 million face videos from 90 countries around the world. So we're very thoughtful about um, kind of how diverse is that data across gender, ethnicity, age, you know, do we have people wearing the hijab? I'm originally from Egypt. And at some point, our team of annotators back in Cairo said, you know, we spend our entire day watching videos annotating for facial emotions we've never seen any woman who looks like us. And it was like an oversight, as it often is. So it's really key that the data is diverse and it translates to a diverse training data set. Um, and then when we validate the results of the algorithms, we can't just look at an overall like accuracy score, say for happiness or you know, disgust or you know, distraction, which are some of the expressions we detect. You have to kind of go one level deeper and look at subpopulations. Like, is it accurate? Is it as accurate on an average wh white male as it is on, you know, an Egyptian American like who looks like me, right? Like, it's, a, it's so important to dig that, dig really deep into the results. And um, and then I just want to kind of highlight what Ati said. It all goes back to the diversity of the team around the table because often, you know, we draw from our own experiences. Uh, when we design and deploy these algorithms and the more diverse the experiences and the voices around the table the better and more robust um, the results are going to be and then just finally to case point I'm, I'm a young global leader at the world economic forum and i just love what wef's doing bringing multiple stakeholders around the table like startups like us and you know big tech companies and product builders and business leaders and academics and ethicists and even civil liberty organizations right like we've had meetings where we've had aclu around the table or amnesty international and you know they poke holes at what we do and i think that's great um these kind of multiple stakeholder conversations is absolutely what's needed to solve this. Right, thank you, Rana. And just to put everything, all of this in perspective, right? So if you think about the core part of an, any AI system, the core part as, as, as we discussed is data, right? And in the data side, 
there is first of all sort of the data generation processes right and how is the data being generated is it being generated in a representative manner that's the first thing right then often what you have is a, sometimes a labeling process where somebody says you know, this person is smiling this person is a man this woman person is a woman right this is the skin color and so forth this is a, this is a labeling operation so uh, just to start with when we're thinking about these systems we're thinking about is the data coming in representative are we getting all parts of the population right coming through then when there are people labeling are the people that are labeling diverse enough to understand what's the hijab face versus what's a not a, not hijab face what's the black face which is what's the white face which is what's a woman which is not so you want diversity in the labeling aspect of it then you have algorithms right there's their training aspect which also has lots of humans involved which is trying to then take their training data and make sense of it and that's again where things can fail because you know from that video that google sort of tested those algorithms and saw those predictions and yet those people themselves did not see the bias built in because guess what they didn't even know to look for for, for people with dark skin for example and so again on the on the on the algorithmic side again we have these questions and then as we sort of think about deployment right there's another check where you say okay i've got the algorithm and then some set of executives somewhere are making decisions to deploy these algorithms so across each part of the ai chain data generation labeling algorithms deployment you have humans involved you have people involved you have people making decisions and part of the challenge that i think executives will face is that you can no longer sort of leave it to your engineering department right you can't just say hey engineering department you guys figure it out this has to be something that as sort of ati pointed to something that the business has to take a close attention to and you can't just sort of say you know after we deploy the legal will deal with the consequences that's going to be too late you're going to be in the headlines and it's going to look pretty nasty so as we sort of think about what we have in front of us right we have in front of us a real set of challenges that are not going to go away right as techie told us these challenges are not going to go away and all of us need to be paying attention to these challenges so let's talk about this from your experiences in the organizations that you've worked with. Is, you know, what are some best practices you've seen organizations deploy to get through any of the, the areas we talked about? You know, the data collection, generation, the labeling, the algorithmic development, and then the deployment side. What do you see work? And what should our executives that are joining us, uh, you know, over 500 are on Zoom here with us, and then there's masses amount on, on Facebook land, you know, what should what should we be telling them as to the best practices are in this space for us? Um, so maybe we'll start with Ati. Ati, what, what do you sort of see as the best practices in the deployment uh, of algorithms? Oh, sorry, I'm just having um, issues with my network here. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Yes. Okay, so I think my company, one of the things that I'm predominantly proud of is the concept of, of the diversity aspect of it, in that you'd see that the, the, the data scientist composition across the, because our company operates over seven countries, and it's so strange, we were discussing that just earlier on, where we have a, a, a balance of about 70 to 30 in terms of African to other races in our organization. And then also from an age perspective, we have a lot of young people that are also empowered. I think what becomes important is one thing for you to have people in the room that tick the box in terms of the diversity, but their voices being heard is actually quite an important factor because how the data is interpreted becomes very important in how we end up positioning our value propositions to our customers. Uh, isn't diversity hard to get like you know i know like at least here in the us what we see is like everybody says we want diversity we want diversity but then you know they then they you know try to recruit tech workers and there aren't enough diverse people so what do you do so how do you how, i i get the point about diversity being important but how do you actually make it happen inside of your company so what we've done and i think one of the things i almost had to acknowledge the lack of diversity and skilled resources so it's like a balancing act right you don't want to be diverse for the sake of I then took it upon myself to say, taking on graduates is in of itself not a bad thing. And that the idea is to first crawl before we can run and fly. And then the moment, I, and at the time I was reporting to our group chief um, finance officer. And as you can imagine, finance wants to return on investment in no few amount of months. 
but I think as, as fast having, as possible. Yes. Yes. Right. <laughs> so they, 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 for me to get him to understand that there is going to be a longer term investment as opposed to you offshoring such a key component, which is AI in your organization. You want to build your own forest, but you have to plant the trees and be able to nurture them, right? So I think that's one of the things we've done, right? That leveraging off our universities and our grad program, we're able to onboard that diversity and build it ourselves. Fine, the downside is that they leave us because other people want to buy instead of grow. But at least the energy is there and business has the appetite to pay for the skilled resources that it might not be as diverse, but grow the diverse um, skill sets that we require. Great. Thank you, Arthur. Kay, your perspective on this. I think I'd like to start by saying every company needs to get its head around the fact that it will be an AI company. Um, so you might be a drug company, but um, you'll be using AI in the drug in creating drugs, but you'll also be using AI everywhere in your back office as well. And so what the C-suite has to understand is that um, you have transformed yourself or you will transform yourself into an AI company. And that brings all the benefits of AI, but it brings the risks that we're talking about. And so Having transformed yourself into an AI company, it's a good idea to look at some successful AI companies like Google and Microsoft and others, IBM, who have actually sort of had to tackle some of these issues. They might not all have been 100% successful, but at least they've tried. And so um, we, we've uh, got two, we have a responsible use of technology project um, in which Big, com big AI companies allow us to look at what they're doing and then publish it. So we've also already published what Microsoft's doing and what IBM's doing, so that people can learn from that. They might not want to replicate everything. They might want to mix and match, but at least they've got a starting point. And I think it's really important to have that starting point especially if you're a small and medium sized business, which I think a lot of the businesses here will be. You know, you can't avoid this. It's brand risk, it's also getting money. You know, if you're a startup, you're, you're going to get, you're probably going to get money better if you already have your responsible AI built in and you're not going to crash and burn. Um, so, so all these are really business issues it's not just this sort of unique thing over here called AI. And also, of course, you know, we're looking at regulation in a lot of countries, a lot of countries not, but um, if you're doing business with Europe, for example, next year you will be hit by regulation. And some of the, one of those things is human resources. We know that bias is endemic in human resources. So I'll yeah. stop. Thank you, Kay. This is this is fantastic, and I, and I think I think I agree with your thesis that I mean I think all companies are AI companies, whether they like it or not. And I think it's about time that you know executives understood it and took it on. You know, I joke around at, at HBS on our campus that you know people come to our school for an MBA. Uh, you know, Teresa is a graduate of our program, and Teresa was you know subject to taking accounting. Now, if you made accounting an optional course, nobody would take it. Right, but we make it a required course because we think that accounting is the foundations of how you understand business. And our sense today is that data science and AI is again the new accounting. Like you have to, as a, as executives, need to understand it. You you don't have to become a data scientist to understand what how it works and why it works and what the limitations are. Just as you would uh, have in accounting. And I think it's important for people. Uh, our, our audience is to understand that that uh, that as you become an AI company, the benefits of AI you can scale exponentially, but also the harms as well, right? Like sometimes if you think about bias, all of us are biased in one way or the other, but individually our bias is limited to one little small ecosystem, one small area. But now if I encapsulate that bias put it into code and then run my company based on it, then all of a sudden I'm scaling my bias across the world. And that will have, you know, both brand risk, customer risk, and then of course, as Kay said, uh, regulatory risk as well. 
All right. So Techie, what, what are you sort of seeing, um, you know, if you were to sort of advise executives that are listening into us, uh, what, what advice would you give them as you start thinking about them uh, deploying AI uh, and thinking through uh, the various bias issues they need to face with? Thank you, Karim. I think leadership is, is a very important um, tool in, in this whole situation of minimizing, um, you know, biases in AI systems. And, and so I will call heavily on, you know, building the capacity of leadership. And I think I love what you have said about the AI being the new account understanding how these technologies work. In the past few weeks, I've actually read a report even around discrimination on online ad uh, delivery. And, and, and most of us are actually using AI tools to, you know, advertise our businesses and deliver. So you can just imagine how you are perpetuating some of these biases, even if you're not the ones building the system. So leadership is very important. And aside from that, let me also highlight, um, I think in, lately, one of the very good work that has been done by the UNESCO Adult Group, which was just adopted last November, which is the ethics of AI, um, um, recommendations that was made by an adult group. I was a part of this. Um, you know, these recommendations looked at a broad scope of things. They highlighted certain critical values. And I think that these are very simple things that leaders can have at the back of their minds, right? Values around human rights and fundamental human rights, values around diversity and inclusion, values around justice, fairness, and equity. These are things that even as a leader, you don't need to be a trained data scientist to ask your team uh, these questions, right? You can also look at principles governing do no harm, uh, principles around governance and collaboration. You also want to look at principles around safety and, and um, security of, of some of these tools that are being recommended, fairness and non-discrimination. And so I think that we should also be looking at raising more awareness and capacity of leadership around some of the core values and principles. And the UNESCO recommendation will be a good place that I can let everybody, because it's a very simplistic tool that you can read on. It also highlights some 11 action areas that even as leaders, you can, you know, start from there. And so yes. these, I, I believe these questions and values are the things that will, you know, let us and then let our teams start asking themselves, okay, does this address these issues? Because once we're asking the right questions in the room, we're able to trigger, you know, uh, the right responses that can enable intervention. Also, I want to highlight... Thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you, yes. take, 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 let, me, let me just connect something you just said to what Kay also said, which is I think part of I think what is what is going on is that there's a ton of good work being done by UNESCO, by the World Economic Forum, which is free and open to the public, right? It's not as if there's a secret set of new rules that have been set around these topics that people don't know about. Most of the companies are actually transparent. So the work that Kay was talking about in terms of Microsoft and IBM and what they're trying to do about responsible AI, they're teaching the rest of us and what to do. And so I think a, a real part of the leadership responsibility, Taki, as you're mentioning, is to go on a learning journey, right? Invest in your learning, invest in the learning of your staff and your executive team. So they're up to speed as well on these topics. And much of the blueprint on how to do this, how to do this well is public. It's free, it's open. And so then the, the hurdles are actually quite not as high as we had imagined in, in other, other eras. So Rana, I want to bring you in as well. You know, uh, as an aside, you know, Rana has been helping me run an AI program for executives at HBS. And, you know, she's seen, you know, over 300 people or so in our journey so far. What is your sense about the awareness that executives need to have around this topic and what they need to be incorporating as they start to deploy AI at scale in their, in their organizations? 
yeah, what I found actually fascinating, Kareem, in the classes that, that you know, that I've, you know, very gratefully been invited to participate in with, with your teaching, um, it, it starts at the top, like the leaders set the tone. So if, if an executive team is committed to transforming an organization to be AI driven or AI first, um, that comes from the top and it, and it manifests in all sort of ways. Um, you know, for example, with Affectiva, a number of years ago, I recognized that this, you know, issue of bias has to be a priority. And so I actually tied the executive bonus plan to not just, you know, how much revenue did we bring in and how much growth did we have as company, but also did we actually institutionalize our thinking around mitigating data and algorithmic bias ac across the pipeline that you talked about. And that was really, you know, there was initially some pushback because it is, you know, like, why would our chief marketing officer's bonus plan be tied to whether we implement bias, you know, mechanisms or not. But I wanted to send the message that this is a company-wide priority and it has to trickle down across the organization. Um, and then the other, the other kind of thought is really around investment in education and engaging with um, you know, peers and peer, peer organizations at whatever level, um, trying to share best practices. Um, yeah, I think that's really important too. And, and then just finally, you know, being clear on your core values as a company. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, we do a lot of work in the automotive industry. We got approached by <clears throat> a global car manufacturer, like premium European global car manufacturer. We all, you know, their cars are all over the world. And they sent us a data set to test. And it was literally like these, you know, young, blue-eyed, blonde men. And we had a choice at Affectiva. We could have just tested the data set, gotten paid, moved on. And I actually had to stop the team. And I said, no, we are going to send this data back. We're not going to take the money. And we're going to basically say, this is not good enough. We need to collaborate on a much larger and more diverse data set. So just being clear on your core values and using that to drive business decisions, I think is really key. Great, thank you. So we have five minutes left in the panel. So I just want to be sure that we get uh, last perspectives from everybody here. So Kay, let's start with you. Um, what's the one advice, you know, you have an opportunity to address uh, some of Africa's top women business leaders here in our forum. Uh, what's the one piece of advice you would give them around bias and AI? What should they do? Um, my one piece of advice is that responsible AI, and we've only talked about bias, but there's lots more to responsible AI, should be the foundation of the way that you build your company with AI. If you don't, you will surely fail. You will make things worse. As I think Kareem said earlier, one, you know, one problem with this bias thing, and it's out of control. It's like putting it on steroids. So build that responsible AI foundation. And to do that, that's an end-to-end -end guidance framework. And your responsibility for your algorithm sometimes doesn't end up at point of sale. Great, thank you, Kay. Ati, your perspective on this. Advice you're gonna give to executives who are yes. listening to you today. So it's gonna be very uh, important. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about, apart from the diversity aspect, it's almost thinking along the lines of the survival of your organization relies on a shift in thinking, right? The ability to think digital first is so important. And, and I think, I'm not sure whether it was Kay or Rena who actually made a comment about how AI needs to be in every area in organization, whether it is from a revenue generation perspective or whether it is sustaining your, your capital expenditure and, and making the most of your capex expenditure, AI will be there. And if it isn't, you're doing something wrong. So yeah, I think at best, that's what I can say. So both embrace AI, but also know about the issues that you, you would have as you would uh, deploy them as well. Great. Uh, Rana, your advice to African women uh, leaders that are here on our forum today? Um, I would say um, prioritize making yeah, AI kind of implemented across the organization and just keep pushing on the diversity agenda and, and inclusion as well. So, um, yeah. and, and, and I would say African women are already rocking it. So keep rocking it. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Anna. Techie, your perspective. Um, every organization has its set of values within which it is built 
its organization. And I, I think that most of these are ethical values that we should not depart from. And so when it comes to adoption of technologies and tools, um, we should see it within the context of these values and then build ethical um, framework policies around that and then have some ethical impact assessments done when it is adopting and using these technologies. Great, great, Techie. Well, listen, you know, I, I, I think I, one of the things I want to mention to all of you, just, just sort, of, uh, uh, sort of coalescing all of your comments together is just my own experience. So, you know, I've been at Harvard Business School for 15 years. I'm in what's known as the Technology and Operations Management Group. And over the last five years, we've made a concerted effort to, to diversify our faculty recruiting to include computer scientists. Uh, so we have a CS person from Stanford, somebody from statistics uh, at Harvard, somebody from Penn, uh, somebody from MIT, and, and they brought in a new toolkit and they all in many ways asked this question about bias and fairness and transparency in AI. So the computer scientists now working in the business school because we feel that any operations anywhere in the world was going to be so heavily influenced by these technologies that as a business school we need to have people that are well versed in these technologies can both teach the sort of the senior faculty with gray hair and no hair you know uh, to also uh, learn new tricks but also importantly to our students and our executives who come to our campus to also understand the core of these things and the fact that we have sort of fairness labs transparency labs built into the work that's happening at hbs and other top business schools tells you the importance of this subject and i'm so grateful uh, to Rana, to Techie, to Aati, and Kay to joining us today to really give this leadership perspective. Because again, we don't expect you to become data scientists, but you need to be able to lead the data scientists and the rest of your organizations in adopting these technologies and deploying them and to be well aware of the potential harms that may also be inside of them as well. So with that, Teresa, I'm going to turn it back over to you uh, to take us through to the next part of our program. Well, thank you for leading that conversation and Rana, Teki, Ati, K. can't thank you all enough for being a part of this conversation. Just as we started this with a video, we're going to wrap it with another short video that talks about um, erasing our voices in, uh, in voice recognition technology. We looked at facial recognition technology and we're going to just have a, a quick three minute video that I think is a good way for us to end this conversation. So um, fantastic. We hope you all stay on for the rest of the session. I'm just thrilled that we're off to such a good start. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. Whose voice do you hear when you think of intelligence, innovation, and ideas that shape our worlds? Whose voices are dismissed diminished and erased. When we hear the stories of glories past and present, discoveries far and near. Whose voices rose up to demand to be counted and heard? To be respected and remembered for revealing contradictions in tales of mythical equality, supposed superiority, and fleeting fairness. Whose voices fought so that those at the margins and intersections could be free to develop their minds, advance our humanity, and uncover our buried abilities. And yet, despite the strides, the battles continue. Far too often, we still face erasure. Erasure from both humans and machines. Machines that don't hear the way my sisters, brothers, and siblings speak. Machines that erase my mother's medical needs my partner's job opportunities. And machines that erase you and me. Machines of flesh and blood networked together that cancel our contributions and our full expression as individuals. Machines of silicon and steel that reflect the biases of their makers and societies. Machines that listen for commands using names and voices that reinforce the role of women as subservient recipients of demands. Alexa, Siri, Cortana, are you listening? Yes. yes. Do as I say. Answer my questions in a pleasing way. Is it okay, Google and others, to capture data shared unaware 
snatching snippets of intimate whispers? No. no. We need to remember we have a voice and a choice. We do not have to accept conditions that continue traditions of silencing. We must reject terms that reduce humans to data that fuels surveillance. We cannot let the promises of AI overshadow real and present harms. We will not be dismissed. We will not be erased. Instead, we will beat the drum of solidarity marching towards a future where technology serves all of us, not just the privileged few. Let my voice, let, let let voice your voice, voice be, be heard. heard. And let me tell you a little bit about where we're going in this conversation from here. Um, we, first of all, are going to have a fantastic panel that we've asked Karen Lakani to put together because we are here to serve the women CEOs of the Africa.com definitive list, and not only them, but everyone else, like the rest of us who are on this call today. And so Karen has brought together a fantastic panel. And what we asked him to do with that panel is to bring global experts to Africa. These are people who may not have anything to do with Africa. We wanted just the best in the world to talk about the leading cutting edge trends in the industries that are most important to Africa. And so Karim has done just that. And then later on, we're going to be hearing uh, from his colleague, Sadal Neely, about, you can hear about change. You know, when we listen to what's happening in AI, you start to recognize that, you know, the coding is the easy part. Getting your organization to change is the hard part. So his colleague, Sadal Neely, will be on shortly after that panel to discuss that with Karim. And then we're going to reveal the women who are on the list. And then five of those women are going to tell us how they are using AI in their companies. Now, as if that isn't enough, before we get to all of that, we recognized when we were putting together our program today that because we're hearing from women CEOs and global experts, that there are a lot of women who may not be CEOs in Africa doing some incredible things in AI. And we wanted to make sure today on the International Women's Day at Africa.com that we introduce you to those women we want you to see the women on the ground in all aspects of the chain who are working on AI and making incredible advances across Africa. There are some amazing African women in the space and we produced a special video. I'd like to thank my colleague, Deborah Winter, who produced the video to introduce you to the African women rocking AI. The universe of data is a very exciting place, and we machine learning people love exploring this universe. It's made up of code, metadata, and the interactions between them. Our data universe is an extremely complicated place. It's not necessarily about the code that we write, or the typing, or the compilers. It's about the products we build and the effect that it has on people. I am Aisha Evans, CEO at Zoox. The one thing we all agree upon is that AI is going to drive. And if AI is going to drive, one has to re-architect and redesign the vehicle to make it easiest and safest for AI to drive. That's what we're up to at Zoox. Imagine with me the endless possibilities when we use AI to amplify our own intelligence. AI promises to bring unparalleled benefits to the continent. AI is and will continue to provide us the opportunity to rewrite our future. And from Essentially, instead of it being artificial intelligence, it could be accelerated improvement, a way for human beings to evolve faster than we've ever been able to do in previous um, millennia. And it will also allow us to be better humans, to be able to use technology to help us connect um, and engage with people in a more meaningful way. 
So I was born and raised in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where I was really interested in mathematics. I realized that actually I could explore both my interest in mathematics and my interest in questions around inequality and discrimination at the same time as a computer scientist. I am Abakia Denle, the CEO and founder of Ajala, a startup that's building enterprise speech technologies for African languages. We are starting to see enterprises uh, adopt AI solutions in Africa. My name is Aisha Walcott Bryant. I'm a research scientist and manager at IBM Research Africa, based right here in Nairobi, Kenya. So when I saw that there was a lack of contribution from people of color and also women in the different AI tools that were being developed, uh, the only solution I thought was having early childhood tech education, but also inspiring those who are already in the workforce to pursue these types of uh, career paths. Robotics isn't something that's exotic. You can use everyday materials and actually create an autonomous system. The future of Africa really depends on our young people participating in civilization building, becoming creators of technology rather than just consumers. Because when you know how to create, then you can create solutions. You don't have to wait for someone else to create solutions for you. I'm Miguel Diakabana and I lead the Africa Forward Collective. The future of AI in Healthcare Without Borders is one where equitable and inclusive solutions developed by a diverse group of collaborators are deployed all over the world to places where they're needed most to help serve as decision support. And along with them, there'll be policies in place to ensure that they're developed, deployed and used responsibly. By, using, by virtue of using deep learning or by virtue of having these big data sets or whatever it may be, machine learning is a method where because you're using data rather than explicitly defining rules for prediction, you can't use it in particular context. Or you can't use the current version we have of it in particular context. And I think audit, audits have done a good job really um, exposing this fact. So I'm a data scientist at a company called Africa Stalking. I do a lot of work with building machine learning communities. AI brings a whole other aspect, which is how we've ended up in this age of artificial intelligence. I'm really excited about AI and development. I think that the fact that there is a need for development then makes AI even that more exciting for us to be applying. Any technology that has some type of human capability. So think of the five senses. If your technology can see, if your technology can hear, if it can sense you, then it certainly has computational elements that use machine learning. I can see artificial intelligence helping doctors in identifying tumors or helping in diagnosis with certain diseases. I can see artificial intelligence in many, many, many applications mm -hmm. like agricultural robotics. I mean, you take any field, there is a place for AI there. And I, I think it's the future and I think it would definitely help humans not, not replace them. I'd like to introduce again, Karim, and also just acknowledge a couple of other people who are with us today. We have just a fantastic audience. Um, we have some real fantastic leaders, uh, women leaders who also should be recognized. We have Sega Gabreas, um, an alum from Harvard Business School, Ethiopian, who is running a huge uh, private equity fund called Satya. 
and someone um, who I respect tremendously, and I'm so pleased that you're with us today, Sega to Learn. We also have another one of Karim's um, colleagues, Professor Linda Hill, in one of our historic moments. Uh, Linda was the first African-American woman to make tenure at Harvard Business School. And we really thank you, Linda, for joining us as well today. So Karim, this is your panel, and I will just uh, give my thanks to all of the fantastic people that you have assembled from your network. On behalf of Africa.com, I thank all of you for being here, but I will let Karim um, handle this panel because you are all his relationships. And so on behalf of Africa.com, thank you. Over to you, Karim. Thanks, Teresa. And let me make the segue to the video that you just showed, which is just uh, supremely excellent, which is, again, people say like, what is different with this technology than the past technology? So if you sort of think about, jet engines, right? We don't need to understand sort of aerodynamics and, and physics uh, and mechanical engineering to be able to fly a jet plane, right? Uh, to fly in a jet plane, we just we just get on it and it just takes us from point A to point B. Um, or you think about power generation, or you think about telecoms. We just use the technologies because that's all we do. We don't need to understand how electrons move right in our power generation system or how electrons move in a telecom system that just works. The difference with AI and the reason why we think this is a business challenge and not just a technological challenge is that AI is going to change the way you run your company. AI is changing the way it's running your company. And so you no longer have the choice to black box it and leave it aside. You have to, as a leader, take it on and understand what's at the guts of it. And guess what? You will not just be buying it off the shelf. Most likely you'll be deploying it, you'll be putting it to use. And that's why it's important for you to become a student of this and know how to lead your organizations in this transition that all of us are being faced with. So with that, I want to uh, sort of uh, give you a sense of our panel and how we're going to run it. So um, we have leaders uh, from the energy sector, from, uh, from agriculture, from technology, from telecoms and finance with us today. And I'm gonna do one-on-one -on -one conversations with each of them. It's gonna be almost like a speed conversation. Um, and so I'll introduce each one of them one at a time. Uh, overall, this Jason Krizan from, from Woodside Energy, Michael Gilles from Topcon Agriculture, Wembu Kenya from Elephant Ventures, Magna Sina from Verizon, uh, and uh, Sharice Smiley from uh, uh, JP Morgan AI Research. And we'll, each of us will go through uh, basically uh, what is happening in the industry and what executives need to know about that. Uh, and so that's the way we're going to run. So first, I'm going to call on Jason Cruzan. Uh, Jason, if you want to uh, uh, reveal yourself to the rest of the world uh, with us. Um, and Jason, let's just get right into it. You've been both at NASA and now in the past few years in the energy sector at Woodside Energy in Australia. Um, how is AI changing the energy sector as you see uh, from your from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Kareem, and thanks for having me uh, as well on this important topic. Um, it's, I think it's one of those things where we actually don't even realize how how much it's going to change across our energy sector. Uh, within Woodside, I mean, we we've started down the AI journey several years ago on just simple things of making plants smarter. So we we produce liquid natural gas uh, as a company. We transport that from Australia to customers around the world, and. Um, one of the key things that we've been learning is we have very old facilities. So how do you make old facilities, new facilities again? Um, so from that kind of sector to our future vision of actually, how do we have autonomous facilities, smart enough facilities that actually run safely, more efficiently and help us and actually make the decisions how do they run that facility to maximize an outcome, um, whatever that outcome is. Right, and so of course the energy sector is, is, is pretty big in, in, in um, in Africa. So give us some examples from your own uh, settings in Woodside as to how AI is being deployed concretely uh, within the operations of, uh, of Woodside. Yeah, I'll give you a really concrete example. Um, so we've been operating liquid natural gas facilities. We produce about 6% of the world's LNG. And those facilities have been operating for 35 years, so even 40 years in some cases. So there, some of those facilities are really old. So with old facilities comes not very smart sensors uh, and those types of things, analog dials and devices, things like um, what we have called, we, we call oil sight gauges. Oil sight gauges are uh, basically oil feeders for rotating equipment in order to uh, make sure they stay lubricated. 
our current old way of doing that was actually sending people around to actually take a look at those gauges and then top them up with oil as needed. Um, we also operate in 40 to 50 degrees heat all the time, ambient temperature. So it's not a very pleasant task. So one of the things we've done with AI is actually taking cameras and then through machine learning algorithms, we've actually, those cameras monitor the oil levels. They actually take that old analog type sensor and convert it into a digital tag or a digital sensor for us now. So old equipment converting into the modern, what we actually need um, for a couple hundred dollars of actually um, refurbishing your plant basically and bringing it into the 22nd century or 21st century of um, actual um, algorithms. We then take that data and feed it into our overall digital twin of the facility that pulls all of our normal digital control systems and such. And now these smart sensors now bring in all the analog things that we were never able to automate before. We collect that data and now we can uh, do even more optimization uh, for the facility. Right. Um, any other examples? Let's say a bit more about the digital twins you guys are trying to build and why that's so important for, for, for Woodside as well. Yeah, so one of the big challenges we have in the energy sector is the, the cost of bringing something to market. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing is actually creating uh, digital twins of our facilities in order to lower our unit production cost. The lower we can um, bring that unit production cost, the more energy we can bring to the market um, and, and the more projects we can actually get, get to. So um, one of the things we're doing with that AI then is um, deploying that so we can bring more energy market uh, more energy to the market um, and, and basically create autonomous plants of the future. So we, we think about, and everybody talks about autonomous cars powered by AI and such, but we actually think about plants running on level four, level five autonomy um, with decision-making in those facilities. So that one day, instead of um, our facility operators actually making every setting change themselves, what that does is the, the computers have already set the facility for the best outcome for that day. The one analogy I like to use is we operate really big refrigerators in a massive heated area in Australia, so Western Australia, very hot area. Um, it, one, one of the things that AI is actually allowing us to do is think about maybe today is actually not the best day to maximize production because in three days from now, the weather's gonna be three degrees colder. Um, that three degrees colder allows us another 10% efficiency of an outcome. So the actual software and digital twin recommends that we actually turn the facility to down, do more maintenance today, because in three days from now, we can actually optimize production. Um, and that's the type of decision making that is counterintuitive to our industry, which is make all energy at all times and as much efficiency as possible, where actually it's a counterfactual of actually slowing the facility down uh, and using that window opportunity for production, because we know more about it and the computers then help us make that decision. Uh, for production changes that are going to happen three days from now. Right. Thank you, Jason. Um, one advice you would have for our, 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 our leaders that are here learning about AI, what advice would you give them uh, based on your experience at both at NASA, where you did a bunch of AI projects there, as well as um, at Woodside? Yeah, I, I, I just chalk it up to this, go try things. Um, and that's kind of been my own mantra is just jump in, do a project within your organization, within your company. Start with something small, like we did with a small sensor, and just do it. You'll learn some things about it, and then you'll start discovering how it can affect other areas of your business. So it doesn't have to be the perfect project. I always um, like to think about more shots on goals with my teams. So we try 20, 30 different things. And, you know, people tend to forget about the five or six that didn't work. And, start, and you start noticing that the 10 or 15 that did work. So that'd be my advice. Just, just do it and, and then start learning. Great. Well, Jason, I know it's late for you in part, so thank you so much for joining us and, and sharing with our with our audience uh, this great work that you've done at Woodside and also giving a future in terms of what could be possible in heavy industrial settings that we don't think are AI native at all. So thank you very much for taking the time. Oh, thank you. Great. Um, next up, we're going to have Michael Gomes uh, come in. Uh, Michael Gomes uh, is in, at TopCon Agriculture. Uh, Michael, thank you again for joining us. Um, as you know, agriculture is a big part of uh, the African economy uh, and we see AI being deployed liberally across ag settings. Um, so what is happening? Give us an update on what you see happening in terms of AI and agriculture globally. Uh, first of all, thanks very much for this opportunity uh, here on uh, 
International Women's Day. And so um, most people don't think of of women as farmers, but they're actually more than half of the world's farmers. And in many uh, countries, war, specifically war-torn countries, they're the majority of the farmers. And so um, that really uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to, to talk today to this group. So um, uh, with respect to kind of where I, AI is today, um, our company, uh, Topcon Agriculture, Topcon serves both construction and agriculture. And both of those two industries are really the last two that are beginning to go digital or that are beginning down the process of digitization. And so similar to what Jason was talking about, they, there, there's this production mentality of make the most, make the most, make the most. And so really um, uh, uh, a number of these tools and technologies are beginning to change that. And so um, for us, um, there is AI in our industry, but really it, it begins as sensors driving towards automation. And then from their machine learning from those smart machines that be, and we're just beginning aspects of AI. Um, but those, those aspects um, are, are certainly coming in. In the developed world, those are smart connected machines working toward a system of systems with process control focused at kind of this whole concept of agriculture as regenerative, regenerative manufacturing. Whereas in the developing world, um, many of these solutions start a little bit more simple. Um, they're smart. They start as smart tractor implement combinations um, with uh, providing on-time services or uh, apps from the smartphone so that then you can begin to uh, utilize the camera to get data or, or different things like that. And so there are kind of a number of different examples that start to start to fit into that world, if that makes sense. Great, Michael. Great, awesome. So, 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 could you give us what you sort of see as some leading edge examples in the space uh, of agriculture, uh, both sort of at the at the forefront of where you see the future is, uh, and then also, you know, what what you sort of see are the steps that you know farmers need to take uh, today uh, in this in this journey. And I'm actually and thank you for sharing with me that I didn't realize that half the farmers in the world are women. I had no idea about that. So thanks for, for letting me know about that as well. Um, but give us some examples here. Yeah, sure thing. Um, and uh, no problem. So I, I split the a number of when I was thinking through this topic, I, I I looked at it from both the developed world side as well as the developing world side, and and I think there in many cases the developing world will leapfrog past where the developed is, um, just from a number of different perspectives. But you know, so so some examples of this, right? In in the I'll, I'll start off within the developed world, right? So there's smart implements, and these are implements that have a number of sensors on them that can. Control. For example, today there are smart implements that control the speed of the tractor so that then the feedback from the sensors actually speeds up and slows down the tractor or the rate at which the work occurs. That functionality is called TIM, Tractor Implement Management. It's implemented through a standard, uh, through one of the ISO standards as an industry initiative. Um, and in this case, right, when you begin to think of, of the first kind of self-regulating piece, that's the first piece of an optimized system. And so that's really where we start to get to, right? So there are small there are smart all electric platforms. For example, in the table grape industry, there's one that follows people. Um, and from a, 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 an innovative startup company called Burrow, right? Or full size tractors um, from a startup company called Monarch. Um, and that tractor could actually respond to hand signals. And so we're beginning to see the elements of all electric platforms begin to come in. Um, in a number of those kinds of things. From the predictive analytics side, um, you're beginning to see monitoring for on-time maintenance and replacement parts and scheduled maintenance versus unscheduled maintenance and a number of those kinds of things. Um, uh, it, it's not uncommon to, to begin to see semi-autonomous machines. So that would be one operator remotely interacting with and operating multiple machines. Um, a good example of this is orchards in uh, 
is sprayers for orchards and vineyards. Uh, because it, here in uh, states like California, 95% of the agricultural spraying of vineyards will occur at night. Um, and so, so those kinds of things uh, begin to occur. And so you're beginning to see these um, uh, sent up semi-autonomous platforms of the one to many beginning to come in and, and those smart vehicles and implements that are, uh, there are also smart vehicles and implements that are beginning to use AI to recognize weeds and eliminate them. Whether they're using high-speed cameras to take pictures of the weed amongst the crop, um, the definition of a weed is just a crop out of place. And so um, whether they're then using chemical tools or they're using a physical tool like laser, um, right? A, an example of the chemical tools is a, is a startup company called Blue River um, that got purchased by John Deere um, versus the lasers would be an example of a company called Carbon Robotics. That's a startup, right? And so you're beginning to see all of these things start to come into the landscape and that whole industry is called seed and spray. So then you can see it and spray it. Um, and you're beginning to see a number of startups and a number of companies begin to enter that. Um, when it comes to harvesting, there's things like autonomous picking machines in strawberries um, that operate day and night so that then they recognize strawberry ripeness for selective harvesting without people. And that's from a company called Advanced Farm Technology that's operating both in Florida and California. Um, in the developing world, um, it's that begins to become more about contractor services model in machinery. They're, you, they'll bring in and implement the, the machinery because that's the easiest way to bring technology to a new area and to introduce it, right? Um, and so they'll do that from the services model. Uh, a company, a, a startup company called Hello Tractor is using local agents to book online uh, on time services for these tractor implement combinations from a smartphone. Um, and in many cases, they're booking, they're doing that from booking the services through electronic payments. And in many cases, those agents can even become tractor owners. And so they use that as a fundamental step to begin to, to, um, uh, to grow the business, um, you know, smartphones that are utilizing cameras and the online access to weed and pest databases um, or in pest and disease libraries or look at prescriptive treatments, right? There are beginning, we're beginning to get elements of matchmaking services so that then you can do those things. And so uh, a number of our dealers uh, uh, are beginning to utilize, in many cases, training programs specific to women as equipment operators. Most people don't know, but um, women are actually um, pretty well known as better equipment operators than most men. They're much more detail oriented, um, and they they have um, uh, they they really do a nice job of working with the machine rather than rather than working against the machine and and those kinds of things. And so, for example, one of our um, one of our dealers is operating in. Kenya as well as Uganda and they've got these programs whereby they do training for these operators so that that way um, uh, y these operators then can go out into the industry and then oftentimes that becomes the first beginning building blocks of becoming an entrepreneur in in that system. Michael, just some fabulous examples, both in emerging markets and in developed economies. This, this is just great. Um, Michael, what advice do you have for those in the agriculture sector as they think about AI and AI deployment and digitization overall? Uh, what would you sort of say uh, uh, would your advice be from what you sort of see in the industry? Sure thing. Well, um, uh, great opportunity on this one. And so I guess the first thing I wanted to do was, is I wanted to frame up how people think of agriculture. Um, and agriculture is really becoming regenerative manufacturing with sustainable production. Um, and often that means that we're climate smart in a number of different examples. And so I guess that's the first thing is, is reframing a little bit of thinking about agriculture when, uh, amongst your executives. The second thing is, is that these smart connected equipment and services 
are a business model that is easy, that is um, relatively simple to implement, and it's the first step in which that you can use to build an economy, um, and that's significant. And so really then it's about smartphones and applications, as well as becoming familiar with these tools and technologies that are important for you, your nation, as well as your growing economy. Great, Michael. Thank you again for taking the time. I know it's early in California, uh, so it's late for. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, please, question go ahead. for Michael. Thank yeah, you, Michael. Yeah. That was fantastic. I feel like it was around the agricultural world in you know a few minutes to understand all the technology. <laughs> I'd heard of the one that you talked about, Hello Tractor. I, I think that that was founded, if I'm correct, by an African American operating in um, Nigeria. I think of it kind of as Uber for tractors. So small farmers who can't afford a tractor can just call one up, just like you might not be able to afford a car. Um, so thank you, that was fascinating. Um, I have a question for you that came in from the Reverend Claude Alexander, one of our um, very loyal listeners on these events. And he's asked this question, um, you know, particularly Africa looks at agriculture, um, oftentimes in conversations about economic development as a place to create jobs, that there's just so much opportunity. Africa has such fertile ground and the capacity to feed the world. Um, and so it's interesting hearing you talk about how AI can uh, do the jobs of humans. And so can I ask you, Michael, just to comment on that? Um, you know, how do you see these developments in terms of losing jobs in, 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 in economies that, that need these agriculture jobs? Sure thing. And, and so um, like anything else, right, agriculture as the lowest level of labor in an economy, um, really oftentimes in a lot of the world, um, it's people that are um, uh, uh, functionally illiterate or colorblind or those kinds of things. And so, you know, agricultural labor is very, very hard. Um, and, and, and it's hard on the people um, and it's physically demanding. And so one of the things that you're beginning to see is, is that you're, you're exactly right, is agriculture initially starts off as elements of a job program. But I think um, the, the thing that, you all, that we also have to look at is, is that it's um, – uh, both decent work as well as as well as rewarding work and how is it that we in bring it in and use that as a building blocks of an economy and and so I think that um, you're exactly right in the fact that agriculture and masses and masses of people are um, start off in that respect. I think probably the sugarcane industry in Brazil is a great example of this. Is It used to be hand harvesting. It used to be that uh, hand planting and hand harvesting where they would burn the cane and then people would uh, come in and hand harvest with machetes. That entire industry has moved over to a mechanical harvest situation using a high degree of automation, but the jobs and the quality of the work has gone up significantly. The wages go up significantly. The, the respect for the workers goes up significantly. The respect for the environment goes up significantly. And so I think that you're, you're exactly right in that agriculture is the fundamental building block of an economy. But I think that there's also room for elements of these automation or these automated systems to provide good work clean work, less demanding work on the people with higher wages that enables them to become all owners and entrepreneurs and really become fundamental cornerstones in the building blocks of the economy. Does that answer your question, Teresa? Yes, thank you so much, Michael. It does indeed, thank you. Yeah, and, and just to connect to what Michael is saying about agriculture and the environment, I, mean, I think uh, increasingly uh, there's good sense in environmental science that agriculture, if done right, can actually be a source of carbon sequestration. And that if you do it right, it can actually be a massive asset. So if you, if you take these technologies, you, you, you enable the labor to use these technologies, you could potentially have a much bigger agricultural footprint that is both productive in the food and nutrition side of things, but also on the environmental side of things as well. So thank you, Michael, again so much for taking the time with us. Um, now I'm gonna shift to uh, Wembuya Kenya. Uh, Wembuya Kenya is with Elephant Ventures. And uh, as, as we were designing this panel, um, you know, of course, it made sense to have somebody come in and talk about agriculture. Of course, it made sense to come in and talk about energy sector. 
Uh, but the technology sector, I was like, no, the future of the technology sector is so important to Africa that I felt it was important that we actually, you don't often equate Africa and technology side by side as an important sector, uh, but I felt this this needed attention. And so I'm delighted to have Mbubu Kenya. She's a, a colleague of mine from Mozilla. She's a, on the board of Mozilla Foundation. So she's my boss. Basically, I'm on the Mozilla Corporation board. She sits on the Mozilla Foundation board. Mozilla Foundation owns all of Mozilla Corporation. So I've been talking to my boss here, uh, but Mbubu will really uh, talk through um, you know, the technology sector uh, and AI, and it was specifically with the relationship to her experience in Africa. So, Mbui, what's your perspective about AI in the tech sector and in Africa? Sure. Thank you, Karim. And um, what a wonderful opportunity to participate in this conversation and set in there on International Women's Day. Um, so it's really hard, especially since all the fantastic and just very attractive innovations have already been profiled in this session to then speak about technology without speaking about the industries that have been represented, um, where we do a lot of work and certainly where technology is important and working with CIO, CEOs and CIOs, CTOs, in Africa is in sort of AI's impact on business and productivity. And so I, th I think I'll perhaps make it a little less sexy and sort of speak to it in, in that context. And I think um, sort of at a high level, um, the more spoken about changes around sort of AI and its impact um, in technology, but also it, in technology's impact on business and productivity is certainly in the ability to reduce human error. I think these are sort of more obvious, um, faster decision taking because there's less bureaucracy given what has been learned from repeated behavior, faster processing managing the utility of resources. I think there's a lot of consideration by CEOs around like cloud management and the ability to, to serve and serve quickly um, in, in terms of um, their business productivity, 24-7 um, availability. Um, I think the intelligence there is less about whether a server is up or down, but certainly in terms of the productivity of code and sort of lines of code. Um, and then um, I think one last one is maybe the, the, the reduction in repetitive and tedious tasks on the team. Um, I think AI has dramatically improved the efficiency of our workplaces and certainly in the tools that um, are more self-serving, um, even in our ability to be more productive as software engineers. Um, and so that's another area. But I was trying to pull out what I thought would be of greater interest in terms of where AI um, has started to impact uh, and for CEOs and CTOs. Um, one of the areas has been in uh, from a business productivity is, um, and we saw a really big increase in this um, during the pandemic because this customer facing AI. And I think in Africa, we've seen a lot of companies and entrepreneurs and startups come up um, with sort of inventions around chatbots. And, and I think what's been really interesting that um, given that more and more organizations have now shifted to these chatbots, sometimes um, as the only <laughs> line of customer interaction, um, but it's an inventions, and this is, I think, also as a Mozillian, great excitement around the natural language generation and how that's becoming more and more mainstream. So you're able to convert natural language into software code to generate answers to questions. Um, so it's less sort of the hard coded, but it's sort of building the question responses, um, given the better understanding of natural language. Um, I think what I found to be top of mind has certainly been the automation of processes. Um, this is an area where for most enterprises, it's really wanting to seek faster and more reliable ways to streamline and automate. Um, but now there's more and more um, products and, and services that, that allow for sort of really process discovery. Um, so even going beyond sort of what has been manually um, documented as requiring automation or requiring digitization is the ability for AI informed software to be able to be able to find out and to be able to tell you where there's potential blocks and where, where there needs to be um, greater automation. The other is what I call the race for data, um, and I think it's more productive data. Um, and AI is perhaps, I think, as productive as the, the amounts that it is of data that it is fed. Um, I think organizations increasingly need solutions that build more flexible data pipelines um, and the ability to evolve and support thousands of sources, um, incorporate structured and, and unstructured data um, and provide it in a way that we're not only relying on data scientists and they're harder and harder to find, but certainly making business leaders and technology leaders uh, more able to interpret and to be able to get smarter around data. 
The other one is really around productivity. And I think this is when you think about software engineering, um, how do we enable for more efficiency and productivity? And I think there's a lot of um, ways that AI has continued to enable um, this in terms of how can we perform some of the more mundane and basic tasks? Um, the other day, someone was asking me, can you help me find developers who can build me a website? And I said, well, who builds websites anymore? <laughs> Especially if it's a non-functional non website. Um, there, there's sort of are ways that that can be done and, and, and increasingly so. Um, and then the other one that I thought was quite interesting, and, and we've got clients that are always asking us about this, which is there's been a lot of work done around segmentation engines and sort of better understanding what experiences customers are seeking. Um, and it's less, especially in the ad space, about what you are serving, but in those interactions, what are you capturing and then evolving in terms of what the customer is, is seeking. Um, so I think those are sort of some areas that I would, I would, I would reference. Oh, fantastic examples of and I think, and I think what you're sort of highlighting again is, you know, what K, uh, you know, from the World Economic Forum got us going with initially, which was to say that that AI is basically getting inside of all types of operations of, of companies, and it's both the customer facing side, the back end side, the process side, but then also the production side. Like how do we actually keep generating these things? And there's lots of opportunities here for leaders to think about this systematically. Maybe given where you're at, you know, at Elephant and your prior experience in Mandela, can you just give us a sense of the technology sector in Africa and how leaders should be thinking about the technology sector in general and how AI fits into that as well? Sure. Um, so certainly um, with corporates and enterprises, I think there's still um, a big push towards digital transformation. And what does that look like? And I think um, before I, went, I joined Andela, I was at ThoughtWorks, and I think the conversation there was still about digital transformation, but I think the context in which it is being um, discussed today is slightly different, whereas five years ago, it was really about understanding what digital transformation is and can it have an impact on my business. And now I think there's sort of an urgency around the ability to be fully embraced, it, we fully understand the impact, but how quickly can we not only find the people, and I'll speak a little bit about sort of talent and what, what that means for the ability to, to, to embrace AI, um, but also in terms of what is the orchestration, what are the delivery patterns, what is evolving in the way technology gets delivered that AI can inform. Um, and that's where I think that there's a lot of opportunity to continue to test and iterate, but also to really consider ways to partner with entrepreneurs um, in terms of um, technologies that might make it easier, especially in, in, in areas of differentiation, um, but then also to really leverage the tools that have already been built that might make it um, a lot easier to embrace things like process automation um, and, and, and certainly building customer experiences for a very evolving um, customer base that is a lot more aware about sort of how they make selections and how selections are made for them. Um, and so who are they in that conversation when a customer is, is considering product or service um, is also a big consideration for a lot of um, corporates and enterprises. At, at the, what I would call medium enterprise or sort of well, sort of well-funded startup, if I can call them that, I think it's just really more the how can they work faster, um, given they don't always have the resources to build, um, and how can they leverage AI um, tools for productivity, um, but also for pivots and sort of making sure that they can re-engineer or, or not even have to engineer portions of what it is um, and the, the reusability um, of libraries and frameworks and just sort of the ability to pick and choose and piece together um, um, more productively. And then at the startup, I think it's, it's, it's really in trying not to reinvent what doesn't have to be reinvented and really trying to figure out what, what, where can we differentiate um, as a startup. And I think that there's a, a couple of examples that I can think of of companies where it may also exist outside. So the, these inventions may not be new to the world, but certainly how they are made accessible to small and medium businesses um, can be differentiated in what they build um, in Africa. Right. And, and tell us about talent. Like, how do we get talent? Uh, what you've seen talent from a Dandela perspective, from a ThoughtWorks perspective, and an elephant as well. What do you say, what is your prognosis on talent uh, around AI and digital uh, for Africa? Sure. Um, there's certainly, um, and without that, a talent drought. 
Um, and I think it's, I mean, we can refer to the McKinsey Global Institute reports around the jobs to be lost. Um, but I think even for the people who, when I sort of think of talent as a pyramid, where you sort of have your very highly skilled AI data scientists, and then perhaps at the base, um, sort of just people who are more digitally aware, um, the cadence in which they have to be upskilled feels like it is more pressured. Um, there's a lot of people and the world is becoming increasingly aware of talent that exists in Africa. So in Africa, um, there's, a, 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 there's a race for finding, but also retaining um, uh, just talent <laughs> as a whole. Um, and so I think there's, there's a need for CIOs and CEOs to really think about what are the core things that are really truly required um, of the staff that is ultimately building for differentiation versus where can there be borrowed utility of services that provide some of the core operational processes? Um, and, then, and then really focusing on the experience you're building for the talent in order for you to be able to keep them. Um, but it, it's, 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 because it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it, it totally. So, so in conclusion, when we, um, advice you would have for, you know, the, the women leaders that are here, both uh, in person on Zoom and also on Facebook on how to think about AI and the technology sector, specifically in Africa as well, given your purview. Sure. Um, I think lending again to talent. How are you hiring? Who are you hiring? How are you considering? Um, what are the pieces that are most important to you that might be that might benefit AI? And what are the pieces that actually are just more like operations and processes of record where you can leverage um, technologies that exist already? And then where you do need to hire talent because you're looking for their cognitive and creative and critical skills. Um, how are you engaging and keeping them? Um, I think it's, it is really easy to think about sort of what is exciting about AI, but I think there's also a responsibility um, that CEOs need to think about, which is really around um, topics that have been covered today, bias. Um, and, and, and what is the influence of bias on what it is you are offering a service um, or product, but also really thinking about data and privacy. I think in Kenya, that's become even more um, real for a lot of CEOs or for companies that are looking to operate in Kenya um, and better understanding what are you collecting and how are you making that transparent and, um, and, and, and not manipulating given where AI has advanced to. But I think similar to other panelists, it's just really an understanding what is most important for your business, getting a better sense of where there's been AI innovation or where you can apply AI innovation to differentiate. And then what's really important to just test and iterate. And for that, look for partnerships. It isn't always about building your own teams, um, but find the fluidity in, in, in finding those AI tools that can better serve you on things like productivity, but then also help you build your differentiation. Thank you so much, Rambu. I really appreciate it. And uh, again, I really uh, am so grateful for you taking the time to, to talk to our, our, our audience. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. um, so just as a, as a navigation, we started with energy and agriculture. We went to technology and now we're going to go to telecoms. Again, a really critical industry uh, for Africa. Uh, and so Meghna Sina from Horizon uh, is joining us. Uh, Meghna uh, is part of the AI uh, deployment teams at Verizon. Uh, so, Meghna, uh, uh, thank you for joining um, and uh, give us a sense of uh, how AI is being thought about in the telecoms industry and the purview you have uh, from Verizon uh, here in the U.S. Fantastic. Good morning, Kareem. It's good to see you again. Um, yeah. yeah, so let me jump right in. So we are, um, I'm, I'm leading AI in Verizon. We are a roughly two-year-old organization. Um, that is focused on industrializing AI. And what that means is that we're not just doing uh, small projects, point in time modeling. Many companies and even including us have been doing that for years. And there's benefit in that. You want to predict how your customer, when your customers will churn, you want to predict all kinds of things in the company. But um, it's, there's enough research done to show that 70 to 80% of the value of AI comes when you can incorporate it in a way that it's continuously deployed and continuously integrated into your business processes. So for the last two, two years, we've been focused on standing up the infrastructure and designing the kind of algorithms we want to have in place to 
think of AI as a pipeline, not just a point in time solution, not just projects, but productizing it, industrializing it. Um, at Verizon or in Telco, you know, the last decade was all about two things, like two things transformed technology. Many companies is wireless and app, apps, right? Mobile apps. Um, we saw companies that were mobile first. We believe that we are at the precipice of um, industries that or companies that will come out because of 5G, AI, and blockchain. I think these three are going to be very important technologies. So we are thinking about how do we build the pipelines of data, the pipelines of models um, that don't not only work for the websites and the apps, but also kind of lead us into the future, um, can integrate with blockchain technology, uh, work seamlessly as IoT devices starts to grow. Uh, you, you can see a future where a house can easily have 100 IoT devices. How are they going to communicate with each other? How are you going to manage that? So that's, that's kind of the context of where, where we are focused on. I'm not hearing you. Did you go on mute? Yes, I did. Thank you. <laughs> um, Meghna, could you, uh, could you give us some examples of in the two years of work you've been doing in this sort of industrializing um, mm -hmm. the AI? And I think it's a very important concept because, you know, we talk a lot about in our work about the AI factory, how AI factory is going to be the, the core beating heart of organizations. So as you have started to sort of industrialize AI from point solutions to basically bringing it across the enterprise, what are some good examples you can sh share with us yeah. in terms of how Verizon is thinking about this and using this? Yeah, no, that's that's great. And, and so for context, for anybody who's not in telco, there are like two big things in telco. One is, how do you plan, build, and, uh, and operate your network? Uh, and as we are moving towards 5G, it's billions of dollars in investment on an annual basis. <laughs> so it's massive and it requires years and years of planning. Our uh, CTO had said that we've been building 5G for 10 years, right? Like, so, so if you think about the investment uh, worldwide, it's, it's massive. The other side of it is our customers. And it's not just you and I individual customers, but companies, right? Like business accounts uh, that are on our network. Um, so what is important is that this plan, build and operate data is very well integrated with customer experience, how customers are using our information, what experience they're getting, how we are acquiring new customers, how we are retaining our customers. So for us, we think about these two entities and that they have to be connected. So we've actually been, um, it's early stages, but we've been building our own digital twin and um, digital twin generally is, uh, you know, it's nothing new. It's, it's, it's used in many, many industries. And you think about digital twin as um, modeling physical entities or physical assets. Um, we're, we're focused, we'll do that too. Like we will, uh, we are building digital twin of our cell towers and all that. But um, another track that's interesting to us is digital twin of our business processes. Um, and that's where AI needs to be fully integrated. And um, some of the speakers before me talked about digital transformation. Digital transformation cannot happen unless the data and AI is fully integrated into the business process. And that's how the jobs change. That's how companies can change from the inside, as you said in the intro. So digital twin is very core to uh, the focus area that we have. And we're thinking about multiple twins, the twin of a network that allows us to simulate capacity changes and capacity changes could be that if you're in a city and if they decide to build a new hospital, um, you're not gonna wait for the hospital to be built. You wanna know two, three years in advance, how will that change consumption in that location for the households, for the businesses, everybody. So a twin technology would be important uh, for us in that. And that impacts our marketing, our customer experience, all of those things. So that's why the network understanding connected with customers. So a set of connected digital twin is one. The other thing that's very inter interesting and it's early experimentation day is that uh, edge AI. Uh, we have been experimenting with, if you have 5G in a facility, so we've been doing some experiments in the context of sports, for example, um, can with computer vision, can you get live feedback in a game? Can the coach provide players live feedback because of 5G? So you are doing the compute on the edge, you're doing the inferences on the edge and you can provide that. That's one use case. But the same application could be used in a business environment for the same, you can use images to get building data and you can use it for security actions as well. Um, so those, those are two probably uh, some of the most cutting edge examples that we're working on. 
Yeah, Megan, you know, it's a revelation to me when you sort of talked about digital twin or processes, because I'd never sort of heard about that in that kind of a context. It makes total sense. And you can imagine that if companies were to build digital twins of their processes, then their ability to anticipate, to change, to account for, for changes in competition and context would be so, so critical. And it's a, exactly. it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting perspective. Uh, that yeah. you provide with this. Two, two things are coming up. Like, see, one is it, there is advances in doing AI on synthetic data. So the whole point of digital twin is when it's cost prohibitive or you don't have the time or resources to figure out what how the changes will impact. That's when you build a digital twin because you don't have enough time or resources to, to, to measure it in the real world. You don't have history. Um, and there is some good research with of AI on synthetic data. So there is, again, we haven't gotten that far, but we are betting on some of the promises of, can you learn from synthetic data? Can you learn from a different market, different part of the world where um, the infrastructure changed and how will that impact? So I, I think it's, it's uh, to your point, digital twin of processes is, is brand new, but there are some uh, small pockets of experimentation and early exploration happening in that space. Great. And then make now advice you have for our CEOs yes. that are here. What advice would you give them as they think about their AI journeys? Yeah, I, I have two. One is, um, you know, I, I see a lot of companies experimenting with POCs and I, my strong opinion is resources are scarce in this space. Don't waste money on testing it out. I think AI at scale is proven. It's not easy. You still need to do a lot of work to scale it, but doing small point in time experiments, um, just like you still have to rebuild it for the pipeline version of AI. So I'm just not a big fan of like doing small POCs that go nowhere. It's like invest in building scale, scale, scaling AI. And I, I thought about it, like, it's like, yeah, for a big company, it makes sense, but would it make sense for a startup? And I've talked to enough people in the startup community as well. Like if you're building a recommendation engine, for example, to personalize your experience, just build the whole pipeline. You don't have to do AI everywhere, but wherever you do, do it uh, for scale. Do it for and scale, then the second, yeah, yeah. yeah. The second thing I would say is that I've been standing up different practices in Verizon. So one of them is responsible AI. Uh, I think every industry, every company needs to invest and figure out what they want to prioritize within the framework of responsible AI. There's a lot there. Uh, again, it's early days, but bias mitigation, risk assessment, all of those things are, have to be part of your toolkit. Great. Thank you so much, Magna, for, uh, for enlightening Thanks. us with your perspectives. Very helpful. Uh, our final speaker uh, is Charisse, Dr. Sharice Smiley. Dr. Smiley uh, is at, at JP Morgan uh, AI Research. Um, and just to put this in context, you know, there was a, there was a headline uh, uh, in January uh, in the FT, in the Financial Times, that said JP Morgan to spend 12.5 or 12.8 billion dollars on technology this coming year, this year in 2022. And it just, I was like flabbergasted. It's like a bank spending this much money. That's about a, a lot of money that goes into life sciences, venture investing in the state of Massachusetts, where I'm from. Uh, so it's a lot of money. Uh, and Charisse is part of this team that's trying to figure out AI deployment in finance. And so uh, Dr. Spani, thank you for joining us. And um, uh, give us a sense of AI and finance. I mean, it's such a big area, it's financial services. What, 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 what can you tell our, our, our audience about this? Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. I'm really excited to talk to you about this. Actually, one uh, particular area I was thinking of uh, might be a bit different uh, from what people were expecting in financial services. Well, uh, because when it comes to finance, you're thinking about uh, strictly the numbers and and uh, you know from that particular perspective. But uh, with my background in natural language processing, one of the things that I'm seeing is an emphasis on uh, documents. So financial, the financial services industry has to deal with tons and tons of documents coming in every day. So this could be things like uh, looking at the regulatory requirements that come in. Uh, the, the level, the just the sheer number of emails that we're having to deal with on a daily and monthly basis, uh, as well as these very long uh, financial filings, for example, so like 10Ks, SEC filings, uh, annual reports, and things like that. So uh, these types of documents could be 250, 400 pages. 
Uh, and what we find is that uh, a lot of times uh, we're, we're sending uh, tons and tons of analysts who have to read through these things or rather skim through them and search, uh, but uh, they're not really uh, able to give it the, the time that it needs and deserves. So um, we're, uh, we're putting a lot of uh, effort uh, into natural language processing, for example, as one way to try to, to mitigate that. And, and Charisse, what is that yielding for the business? So as you as you invest in those technologies, as you digitize those flows, what does that then reveal in terms of what businesses can do, what uh, what your bank can do with this? Yeah. So think about the way that you um, you interact with search engines today. So, for example, Google or Bing or or uh, other search engines. Uh, it's you're, we've moved from just asking uh, simple keyword searches to being able to ask questions uh, over the documents that we see. Uh, but we, we don't really have that in the document space, right, where you're able to uh, not only just think about a, a search term that you want to, to look for within a document uh, and go through it that way, but to ask questions to those documents and being able to give back the answers. So, so we have uh, thousands and thousands of analysts that are having to deal with this on a daily basis uh, where they are thinking about, uh, you know, for example, regulatory purposes, KYC, uh, anti-money laundering and, and other types of uh, issues that they have to deal with. They're having to think of these questions uh, and, and search through and read through the documents one by one, or they're having to route manually emails that are coming in and think about, okay, who should handle this? Who should handle that? We're able to automate a lot of that uh, type of work that uh, people are having to do uh, and to, to give you this experience where you can ask the questions directly to the document and, and being able to get those answers back. Yes, it's almost, it almost seems like you're, you're sort of creating like a superpower for these analysts, right? Because before yeah. you're like stuck in, in document hell, you know, lots of paperwork coming your way and you're like manually scanning PDFs, trying to find a particular set of information. Now the systems are smart enough to basically get, get, give, you, give you the answers you're looking for as well. That's right. Yeah, so, so, so Charisse, uh, how do you sort of see um, uh, sort of uh, more broadly sort of AI being deployed in financial services or within JP Morgan? There's a lot of, you know, you've got some of the best researchers including yourself there now. Yep. Uh, how are you guys working? Um, my, my sense is you didn't do a, a PhD in finance. Uh, you know, you heard your PhD mm -hmm. was an LP. So, so tell us about how this interaction between sort of the AI researchers that are at JP Morgan and then the bankers who may not even know how to spell AI. Like how, do, how, how, do we, how do we connect the dots between them and, and how do you guys work together? Yeah, so uh, we work on a number of different topics. I think Menga, uh, she mentioned synthetic data generation. So that's one of the, the main uh, aspects that we've been working on. And one thing that we think will help to uh, release the data. So there's a, a ton of sensitive data within the bank that uh, you can't necessarily expect uh, or you wouldn't necessarily want to give access uh, directly to uh, researchers and to other AI teams uh, across the bank to work on that data directly right off the bat. So we're able to build uh, models on top of the synthetic data uh, to generate that synthetic data uh, for a variety of different topics and then explore that space uh, before actually working on top of the sensitive data uh, that's available. But, you know, by and large, our interaction with the bank has to do with uh, understanding, you know, different problems that people uh, may be having and, and maybe wanting to work on. So uh, this could be, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, having to do uh, with the, the document space itself, having to do with uh, some of the bias and, and fairness and explainability issues that we're seeing uh, within uh, the, the AI space, uh, modeling financial markets, privacy, security, cryptography, just there, there's a, a wide variety of different topics that we're having to deal with and, and help the bank work on. Great, Sharice. So uh, advice you would have for the women leaders that are here about AI? Uh, 
what's the final piece of advice you'd give them? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, in addition to some of the things that you mentioned early on in your introduction about educating yourself on what AI can do, uh, what AI can't do, I think one of my experiences in uh, working with executives about uh, on different AI projects is that there, there could be a sense that, okay, I just need to explain the problem and then I'll throw it over the wall and have the technologist solve it and they'll bring me back an answer. Whereas I think you have to be a bit more prepared to see it as an ongoing uh, partnership where uh, you bring your subject matter uh, expertise uh, and, um, and, and work in an ongoing way. So this could be a matter of like providing actual labeled data uh, because there's a, a real dearth of labeled data, especially in the financial space. A lot of the data that is uh, publicly available has been uh, created on, on other domains, right? So it's not really tailored to the financial domain. And so we're, we're having to create our own data. And then to think about uh, really like investing uh, people into evaluating these systems, making sure that they work properly, um, and, you know, understanding that, yeah, you, you will have to put some time into the evaluation, uh, every single aspect of the system and making sure that it works well. Great. Thank you so much, Charisse, uh, for spending time with us uh, and letting us know what's happening in finance. Uh, again, very interesting work being done along the way. And my thanks to all of our panelists uh, that joined us. Teresa, back over to you. Well, I'm very grateful to you, Karim, and thank you to the wonderful people that you assembled for this, to Sharice, Megna, Wambui, Michael, you've done a fantastic job. Thank you. All right. So next up, uh, I have my good friend, uh, Professor Sadal Neely uh, joining us. Uh, I'm Sadal going to, is... I'm going to just remind everybody because we introduced her at the very beginning. And I want to make sure that everybody knows exactly who she is. Um, Sadal Neely is the author of The Digital Mindset, What It Really Takes to Thrive in the Age of Data Algorithms and AI. She is also a professor at Harvard Business School, um, Karen's uh, colleague, and she's also the Associate Dean for Faculty Development. So she has a very important management role with respect to Harvard Business School, in addition to being a brilliant professor and author. And so thank you very much, Sadal. I know that you have a very hectic schedule and we are very grateful to you for coming to join us. We talked about your book earlier. It's coming out in May, available pre-sale on Amazon today. Um, so we've got that plug in there. Uh, we're really <laughs> fortunate to have two of the leading experts on this topic, the intersection of business and AI with us today, Karim being one and you being another. Thank you for joining us. Now I turn it over to the two of you. Thank you. Thank you so thank you, much, Teresa. Teresa. I'm so thrilled to be here. Oh, Sadal, before you get going. So uh, listen, yeah. um, so, uh, you know, this is like, uh, you know, invite my boss to, uh, to Africa.com day for me. So, you know, Bambui, you know, my boss at, uh, at Mozilla and Sadal is literally my boss because she's, uh, she's the senior assistant dean for faculty development and also chair of the Christensen teaching and learning center at HBS. And, uh, part of her responsibilities means that she looks after the technology and operations management unit. So she's always giving me calls, telling me I'm not working hard enough and not, uh, not, 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 do, not writing enough and not doing enough speaking. So, so hopefully you guys, uh, I'm trying to impress my boss as we, as we, as we do this <laughs> as well. So, and, and, and as you know, so Sadal, uh, Sadal, uh, you know, we, we both basically joined HBS at the same time. And in many ways, we sort of took um, parallel paths. I was focused on technology. Uh, Sadal was focused on organizations. And I recall a session that both of us did, a, a week-long executive session we both did in Australia before the pandemic, uh, where we were basically forced to watch each other teach <laughs> for, for a whole week. And that's when both of our light bulbs went off, saying that uh, that the conversation about AI and technology is incomplete without talking about organizations and that these two things come hand in hand. And so while I've written a book about the technology strategy with competing age of AI, Sadal's new book on the digital mindset is really what do leaders need to know about AI, both personally, but also for their organizations. So with that, Sadal, um, why don't you walk us through the core tenets of of the digital mindset and what you know, the leaders that are here joining us today should know uh, about the transition that all of us are in the around the globe are in with regards to digital. 
So thank you so much, Kareem. I would be delighted to do that, but we all know that you're my real boss. So uh, no one makes me work harder than Kareem, but I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, happy Women's Day and uh, Africa Day uh, as well uh, for us. So it's terrific to be here. And I thought it would be appropriate for me to begin talking about the digital mindset uh, with uh, a fantastic leader who hails from Africa. Some of you may recognize Sarah Menker. Sarah Menker, if you don't know her story, she sat at her desk in 2008 and as an energy commodities trader, Morgan Stanley, she saw the financial markets collapse. She realized sitting around with her colleagues that a catastrophe was taking place. And so one of her colleagues sitting right next to her says, oh my gosh, this is terrible. This is Armageddon. We need to buy gold. And Sarah, who hails from Ethiopia, says, gold? We don't need gold. We need potatoes. We need potatoes. We all need potatoes. He laughed. She laughed nervously, but she was actually serious because for her, coming from a famine-stricken Ethiopia, the first thing she thought about was, how will this work when it comes to the global food industry? So after that moment, she actually started to think, what can she do? How can she think about agriculture in Ethiopia? And she soon discovered after two weeks of research and reading and looking and talking to people that even an industry as seemingly earthbound and analog as agriculture was in the throes of massive digital transformation. And so she had to begin to adopt a digital mindset. And what that meant was in her research, she soon learned that there was so much interconnection and data that was needed to figure out this market. So for example, a successful uh, Ethiopian landowner would have to buy crop insurance in order to become a farmer, but there was no crop insurance market. If no bank would lend money without the security of crop insurance, then the cost of capital would be much higher. And the land was so remote, it, mean that, it meant that you needed new infrastructure. So this continued to be alarming to her. And she started to think about, wait a minute, I can't stay at Morgan Stanley. I need to get into this business because a global food shortage would soon follow if we didn't take all this data and begin to predict and look at the dynamics of agriculture worldwide. And so here she is, she knows a little bit of analytics, but nothing else. So what does she do? Sarah begins to ask lots of questions. She starts to learn a little bit about computing. She starts to learn a little bit about AI. She starts to learn a little bit about what it takes, the ecosystem view of the world. And ultimately, she launches her company called Grow Intelligence. This company is, in fact, um, so data-driven and data-intensive that she figured out, once she established Grow Intelligence, that she needed to develop a platform that could ingest 400 million unique agriculture data sets that amass to more than 500 trillion data points. So when people ask about digital mindset and what kind of skills do you need, you need to think scale, you need to think computing, you need to think collaboration, you need to understand how all of this comes together. And in fact, Grow Intelligence was so advanced that in 2019 in the US, there was a government shutdown and Grow Intelligence stepped in for the USDA because they were the only ones who can provide predictions for the entire agricultural industry worldwide. Why do I start with the story of Sarah Menker? First, she inspires me. She's extraordinary. 
but she also has a digital mindset and didn't start out this way. It's important to understand that. So what is the digital mindset? Well, the digital mindset actually is our ability to see new possibilities using data, technology, algorithms, and AI to chart a new path for the future. What else do we know about the digital mindset? There's always the question of, well, how do I do this? Do I need to learn how to code? Do I need to learn statistics? Well, what we discovered in this project, my co-author Paul Leonardi and I, we both got our PhDs from Stanford's Management Science and Engineering Group. What, what, is, what is Stanford? I'm sorry, is that a, is that a university? <laughs> It's, it's only, it's a, small school uh, it's in only California. A, a school that's situated in Silicon Valley, the hub uh, oh, of technology oh, in the oh, world. I'm sorry. No, uh, and, I graduated uh, from MIT, so like Stanford, like you don't, yes, anyway, Stanford, sorry, it's sorry. A little, a little, it's a little west, sorry. but here's the thing. Stanford was among the only programs when I was uh, getting trained over 20 years ago that had an organizational behavior group in the engineering school looking at the intersection of work technology and organizations because it was clear that technology was going to revolutionize the world and we needed to understand technology all the way through when we thought about organizations mit didn't have that pro program at the time anyway That's right. so <laughs> let me talk to you about the 30 percent rule of developing the digital mindset digital transformation or the digital mindset is about learning the language of data. So inspired by linguistics, we looked at the top one percentile of organizations and people around the world who are now operating in the AI realm, who are digital first companies. And what we learned was, no, you don't need to become a data scientist. You don't need to become a technologist but you need to understand 30% of everything. Why 30%? In linguistics, in order for us as non-native English speakers to operate in an English-driven world, we only need to understand 30% of the English language, which is about 3,500 words, and effectively work um, in, in any global environment. We don't need 12,000 words, which makes us native masters of the English language. We only need 30%. So what does this mean in a digital realm? We need to understand a little bit about coding. We don't need to be the ones who are coding, but we better understand how Python works if that's the programming language that we need. We better understand where data are stored. We better understand the various ways to analyze data, we better know how machines learn, we better know how algorithms operate, and we only need 30% in order to do that. And so, Kareem, before we, we uh, have a, a, a moment to talk to one another, I wanna mention just a couple of more things. When people think about the digital operations of a company, and they think, oh, it belongs in that group there, it's a mistake because everyone has shared responsibility, shared responsibility for data, data governance, how we think about data across our entire organization, how we think about computing, how we think about change and change management. And that requires us to know a little bit about our systems architecture. We can't be blind to those things and we need 30% of that as well. And ultimately, in this book, we highlight the three C's of the digital mindset. The first one is collaboration. Collaboration, not in the sense that we think about people just working together, in the collaboration with AI. So I often talk, you know, I have the book, uh, um, Remote Work Revolution Succeeding from Anywhere. And I often talk about how it's so important to not just worry about collaborating with Sal and Sally, we need to learn how to collaborate with AI bot 
That's what it means uh, when we're collaborating in these environments. We need to understand how to use digital tools to work. When people are in these debates, uh, in-person work, hybrid work, remote work, what I say is remote work, hybrid work is digital work. So we need to understand those things in order to scale and advance our work, distributed work. The second uh, C is computation. I touched on this uh, a bit, but we need to understand statistical reasoning. We need to be able to understand how machines learn. Boy, do we need to understand the black box of bias because what goes in the input is what comes out. And you can't leave that up to the technologists to enter our data and create our models. We need to understand the factors and the variables. And finally, change. Change is one of the most important competencies for leaders because we will be in this perpetual state of change and learning. And we need to understand how to bring people along in a digital, digital environment where people have to actually develop new skills. So how do you do that is a fundamental question. I'll stop here, Kareem, and happy to talk about anything. So a uh, fantastic, a uh, fantastic view in your book and what is, uh, what you were trying to, uh, to uh, get us all to learn. But I, I get your point, Sadal, about the 30%. But, you know, that's like me trying to be on a diet and like not eating, like trying to cut down on my carbs. It's so hard to get 30% less carbs in my body. Like I love the bread. I love the ice cream, especially if you give me Rocky Road ice cream, I really want it. So it's hard for me to cut, to get the 30% I need to. So how, how do you, how do you, what do you tell leaders about, because many of them excelled in a non-digital world. Many of them excelled in a non-data world. Many of them excelled without having to worry about these gobbledygooks of statistics and like means and, you know, deep learning and XG boost and all that kind of stuff. So now you're telling me I spent all this time becoming a leader. I know how to work with my teams and so forth. And now I got to learn computation. I, I, I got to learn. I got to, I got to, I got to do, uh, do, yes. do programming. Yes. What? You do. And you don't need to do programming. You're not going to be the programmer to do workflows and to come up with systems engineering, et cetera. But you better understand how to ask the right questions, how to make the right decisions, how to think about um, a new business model. Yes and yes and yes. And here's the thing, Kareem. In some of our high schools today, in the ninth grade, they're requiring statistics for graduation. We know at many institutions, and we talked about MIT and Stanford, whether you're a theater major, biomedical engineering, or any other major, everyone is now required to take a semester of uh, coding. Python is the one that people are learning. We also know that we are uh, surrounded by Gen Zs who are digital natives. We all know that our children do programming today. So this is a new language. It's a new lens and we have to learn it. And the last thing that uh, higher education uh, is pushing, particularly in certain programs, is agile methodologies. I'm talking about Scrum and different ways, rapid ways of working. So it's a total mindset shift. So if leaders are not learning, enough that's what why we talk about the 30 percent rule why that's why we talk about the digital mindset in order to lead the digital organization they will be lost wow that's that's uh that's pretty scary so they're gonna be lost um and so how do you how do you get over the psychological inertia around this what advice do you give to leaders as they start this journey you start somewhere. You know, uh, Kareem, you chair a program, HBAP, Harvard Business Analytics Program. Have you mentioned that yet? No, I don't want to self-advertise too much, you know. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I want to mention it because it was several years ago that you put together a program uh, that was interdisciplinary, where you, you have... Um, someone from statistics teaching in the program. You have someone from computer science department at Harvard teaching in the program. Um, you have 
uh, folks from organizational behavior, people analytics teaching in the program. So everyone is learning both statistics and programming, and they're doing it uh, in nine months intensely, but maybe a year uh, spreading it out in an asynchronous way. Those people have a digital mindset from which to build, and they're learning something every day. So I've worked with organizations who've been at the forefront of this, right? Building digital factories and digital learning factories. And, and you cannot avoid it. But the thing about it is once you begin learning, and for me, this journey began maybe about five, six years ago when I started to say, okay, let me look at some Python codes. Let me look at R, let me see how these work. Uh, took an entire course. Um, I try to take, a course at the Harvard Business School. It was hard to take a course with people that you were a professor in too, so that didn't quite work out. Uh, so I went to MIT and took an entire AI course where I learned about all of these tools from natural language processing onwards. But I will admit, uh, my career started 20 years ago where I actually was in technology, uh, in, uh, in uh, telecom. So I've always loved technology. So you start, you learn, and then from there, you'll see how you build. It's no different than language. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So when, you, when you're learning you a new language, learn. you have to learn it. You have to practice it. You don't have to become fluent in it, but to be operational, you have to learn yes. a new language. And when you're learning a new language, uh, you always feel like an idiot initially. Like I always like, like I, you know, I, I don't know what's going on. All the psychological stuff comes in, but you have to get over that barrier and still persist and still do the work. You do, and you know, in this book, The Digital Mindset, uh, we actually cover the 30% that people need. It was probably the hardest thing I've ever written, by the way, Kareem, uh, because I wrote a section on blockchain, which meant yeah. I had to learn the ins and outs and cite you a lot. Um, yeah. I had to uh, write the uh, stats section. I had to really understand cybersecurity, which is another topic that every leader needs to understand. Cybersecurity can't live in IT, we all need to think about privacy and security of data and ensuring that our teams are equipped as well. So the 30% uh, actually makes it manageable. So if yeah. you're on a, on a diet, you're cutting a little bit of the carbs, not 100%, but just <laughs> a little bit of it. <laughs> so, so Sadal, we have five minutes left. Um, and as, as, as you're talking, you know, there, there are two elements here for leaders. One is their own personal journey. Uh, that they have to go on, but then they also have to lead the organization as well in the journey. Because if the leaders aren't bought into this, how will they get their organizations going? So I know we don't have that much time, but but tell us from your research, from your work, from your advising, uh, what are effective ways for organization leaders to transform to help their transformation of their organizations? I mean, that's a whole other course that you know Sadal needs to do and work on. Uh, but but just maybe give us a little bit of a hint ar around it, so that our leaders are both ready for themselves, but also for their for their for their teams that they're responsible for as well. You know, I, Kareem, I would love to just since we're all digital today, um, I would love to to bring in a two by two. Um, and as yes, you by know, the way, this, it's, it's two by two is like uh, in our contracts with Harvard Business yeah. School. We always have to give a two by two. So thank it's, you for it's doing required. that. It's required. It's required. So I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, uh, pulling out a two by two. So right. think of two dimensions where leaders have to make sure that people have buy-in uh, in terms of is this important to us and to our organization for our future. And the other thing is people have to feel like they have the capability to learn digital, to learn about algorithms and how machines learn, et cetera. And you can think of buy-in as get people's minds and the capability part is in a sense, actually this is the people's minds and this is their hearts, right? So if you think about if people have low buy-in and low sense of capability when it comes to digital, how are they feeling? Oftentimes, like they crap. Feel, they're terrible. They feel oppressed. They feel like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. But must be, a car, must be on a car binge. Yes, that's the worst. Um, imagine there's high buy-in. 
you believe you can do this, but yes. you don't think you have the capability. You're 45 years old. How can I yes. learn this whole new language? And if you're in this boat, you're kind of frustrated because you want to, but you don't think you can. But what if you have low buy-in, but high capacity? You know, you took computer science class in high school, you know, you're digitally blessed uh, and all of those things, but you don't believe in this. You don't believe in this. These oftentimes are the whatever people. Yes, in checked out, yes, yes. Checked out. Ultimately, you want everyone in here inspired, learning something new every single day, taking classes, etc. So if you map people onto this, the beauty of this hearts and minds framework is you can move people. And how do you move them, Kareem? Increase buy-in, increase capability, capability, training, messaging, nonstop, all day, every day for years. I love it. And you know, this is so important because you as a leader have to both have the buy-in yourself and the capability yourself. You have to believe that you can do this and that this is the right thing for your organization and the future of your organization. So if you yourself haven't bought in yourself, how do you expect your organization to do that? And then your two by two, if you can again show that two by two, is that actually very important to sort of look at that two by two and sort of see that that your entire organization is going to be spread across this two by two, right? And you you should be able to figure out where people are and move them along the way. So now I could key. spend this is key, yes. Yeah, so Sadal, I could spend, you know, hours talking to you, uh, and we do, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, so thank you uh, so much uh, for joining us. Uh, I want to encourage all the folks that are out in Zoom land and Facebook land to buy. Sadal has two, she, again, she's my boss, and but she's also like very productive. So she had, wrote the most salient book ever, Remote Work Revolution, during the pandemic, pandemic hit, and she goes, yo, I'm going to go write this book. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> she wrote the book and it's been amazing. And then while that book was being done, she's finishing up the second book. And so anyway, I, like, I feel like a slouch and my number is Sadal. But it's it's so fantastic that you were able to join us at all uh, for this conversation. It's an honor. Thank you so much. So much. Great. Appreciate it. Great. I and all the, all the socials are there. Sadal. I must echo Kareem's comments. Um, I see all the chat is going crazy. Um, everybody loved your presentation. I did as well. I've heard great things about you, and I'm so pleased to have a chance to meet you through this event. I've heard that you're going to be the next president of the United States, and I understand oh, that. <laughs> uh, on that note, uh, I, I, it's, no, oof, it is such an honor, but I just would urge every single person here, start somewhere and build and build and build. It'll be exciting over time. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Fantastic. Wow. This is great. Kara, thank you for bringing all your friends. You've got great friends. Yeah, great. I'm very lucky. Yeah, well, it's earned. It wasn't just luck. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're just rocking and rolling today. And so we're going to move into the final bit of our session where we are going to unveil the 2022 definitive list of women CEOs. And then following that, we are going to have five of those CEOs tell us AI in their companies. Um, again, I want to thank my colleague, Deborah Winter, who oversaw the production of the fantastic video you're about to see that will introduce you to who the 74 women are on the 2022 list of CEOs in Africa. With that, over to you, Deborah. Welcome to the reveal of the 2022 Africa.com definitive list of women CEOs. The list, now in its second year, is unique, given that it's data-driven with data provided by Bloomberg. We start by evaluating the 1,364 companies listed on the 24 African stock exchanges as of January 2022. From there, our research team narrows the field to big businesses those with revenue over 100 million USD or a market capitalization of over 150 million USD. That yielded a group of 581 companies. From there, we evaluate the management teams to identify women CEOs or managing directors. 
There are three categories within the list. Group 1 is women who run companies listed on an African exchange that meet the established size thresholds. Group 2 is women who run divisions of companies listed on African stock exchanges where the division itself meets the established size thresholds. Group 3 is women who run the Africa region or an African country of companies listed on global exchanges that meet a higher threshold of revenue of 10 billion US dollars or more. That close to 70% of our staff are working from home and really? we are able to serve the nation and continue to be productive. And, and quality remains the same? Absolutely. It's not about making money. You have to create an impact. You have to think about what you're doing. What's its impact on the environment? What's the impact on the society? We have a responsibility to create an impact on the world. Leave it better than you met it. Although a lot has been done both locally and globally to drive gender equality, there's still so much more that needs to be done. We were so excited to join with the Ministry of Gender and Family Promotion to launch what we call the Connect Women in Business initiative. Oftentimes we think they want you know, a lot of money or they want a lot of benefits, but in reality people are looking for stimulating and challenging work. So pre-2016, we had a bid waste that was in 39 countries. Half of it was food distribution, the other half was a strong industrial South African business. Despite these challenges, our financial results for the first six months illustrate the resilience of the business and the ability and commitment of the Platinum team to reimagine mining to improve people's lives. And now we reveal who has made the Africa.com 2022 definitive list of women CEOs. We start with regional heads of global corporations. At 74, Yolanda Tuba from MTN. At 73, Patricia Obu Nai from Vodafone Group. At 72, Brenda Mbati from General Electric. At 71, Ireti Samuel Ogbu from Citibank. At 70, Lillian Barnard from Microsoft. At 69, Kendi Ndigwa Nderitu from Microsoft. At 68, Mariam Kane Garcia from Total Energies. At 67, Daelo Mujabilo from BP. At 66, Juliette Ehuman from Google. At 65, Teju Ajani from Apple. At 64, Aida Diara from Visa Incorporated. At 63, Kathy Smith from SAP. At 62, Yvonne Ike from Bank of America. At 61, Nunu Njingila from Facebook. We continue with division heads of African corporations. At 60, Naniz Adal from Cleopatra Hospital. At 59, Helene Viesi from Diageo. At 58, Annette Ahern from PSG Consult. At 57, Heleni Echevin from CL. At 56, Elise Rogers from Teresa. At 55, Sally Ann Jackson from Mr. Price Group. At 54, Abiola Baua from UBA Bank. At 53, Kate Rycroft from the Stahl Group. At 52, Aminata Kane Ndiaye from Sonatal. At 51, Ramatulayo Diallo Shagaya from Sonatal. At 50, Richelle Krutz from Aspen Pharmacare Holdings. At 49, Naveen Wefki from Commercial International Bank. At 48, Yoli Swapashe from the Multi-Choice Group. At 47, Fulu Bakudela from the Multi-Choice Group. At 46, Zaida Rylands from Woolworths Holdings. At 45, Kerry Castle from Motus Holdings. At 44, Hana Sadiki from Bitvest Bank. At 43, Mariam Kasim from Vodacom. At 42, Vivian McMenamin from Mondi, South Africa. At 41, Mizinga Melu from Absa Group. At 40, Abina Osei Poku from Absa Group. 
At 39, Kangi Samkize from Sanlam. At 38, Prabashni Moodley from Old Mutual. At 37, Karen Land from Old Mutual. At 36, Nombomelelo Zigalala from Anglo American. We conclude with CEOs of African corporations. At 35, Faith Mabu Ndeta from Sachaba Breweries. At 34, Amelia Biati from Liberty 2 Degrees. At 33, Mama Tajmwati from YNNA Holding. At 32, Olua Tome Somefun from Unity Bank. At 31, Jilan Senho from Trust Bank. At 30, Leila Furi from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. At 29, Miriam Ben Salah Shakron from Olme. At 28, Godfrey Ogbechi from Rain Oil Limited. At 27, Mitwa Ngaambi from MTN Rwanda. At 26, Mugwandi Chibesa Kunda from Zambia National Commercial Bank. At 25, Kiabe Zwipe Gu Mushakane from Absa Bank Botswana Limited. At 24, Lamia Tazi from Sothema. At 23, Jackie Van Niekerk from Attack Limited. At 22, Diane Karusisi from BK Group PLC. At 21, Jailila Mezni from Societe de Tikle Hygienique. Number 20, Owen Omojiafo from Transnational Corporation of Nigeria. Number 19, Mansa Neti from Standard Chartered Bank. Number 18, Anne Jugo from Standbeck Bank Holdings. At number 17, Catherine Lissadedi from Botswana Insurance Holdings. Number 16, Zanele Matlala, Mirafi Resources Limited. Number 15, Mercia Gacy's from SBN Holdings Limited, Standbeck. Number 14, Nassim Devji from Diamond Trust Bank. Number 13, Rebecca Miano from Kenya Electricity Generating. Number 12, Ruth Zaipuna from NMB Bank. Number 11, Natalie Alkir from Central Denon. At number 10, Neka Onyeli Igbe from Fidelity Bank. At number 9, Jane Karuku from East African Breweries Limited. At number 8, Albertina Gegana from Royal Bafokeng Holdings. At number 7, Miriam Olusanye from Guaranteed Trust Bank Limited. At number 6, Rosemary Odo from Kenya Power and Lighting Limited. At number 5, Lizelle Lambrecht from Santam. At number 4, Lynette Francis Salzman from Diskem Pharmacies. At number 3, Bettina Engelbrecht from Clicks Group. At number 2, Nombomelelo Tembegile Matisa from Bitvest Group. At number 1, Natasha Fulyun from Anglo-American Platinum. We congratulate the Africa.com 2022 Definitive List of Women CEOs. For more information about the Africa.com Definitive List of Women CEOs, visit thedefinitivelist.africa.com. For more information on training opportunities and a host of ways Africa.com is supporting the goal of getting more women to the top of African corporates, visit us at thedefinitivelist.africa.com. Thank you so much for rolling that video, Deborah. And I also like to thank my colleague, Soku Sevilla, who did the narration. Um, Soku is very good at pronouncing languages across the African continent from Zulu to Swahili to Arabic. I'm so impressed. Thank you very much for the great work you did in producing that video. There's 74 women on the list this year, up from uh, 50 last year. We did change our criteria, I want to um, and mention. We decided not just to look at market capitalization because we realized that we were excluding some women who ran big businesses. So now to make our list, the women have to have uh, run something that has $100 million in revenue or a market cap of 150. So we don't think that we have lowered our standards in any way, but we've been able to bring on more geographic diversity um, and more industrial diversity through what is still a very strict set of standards. So we're very fortunate that we have five of these CEOs from our list here today to talk about our theme, AI. They're going to tell us how they are using AI in their respective businesses. And the first person we're going to start with today is Lillian Barnard. Lillian is the CEO of Microsoft South Africa. 
Lillian, I think I see you here. We'll get you on the screen and, um, and then turn the conversation over to you. It's been a dynamic day and I'm so pleased that we can move into the conversation now um, and hear what Microsoft is doing with AI. Wonderful. Thank you, Teresa. And it's just great to join you today. My understanding is that my team sent my slide and someone's going to run back for me. Good. Listen, just thank you for the opportunity, uh, you know, to talk on this very important topic. But before I start, happy International Women's Day to all the women who join, all the women around the world who's fighting every day to break the bias. Uh, we've made tremendous progress. Congratulations to all the women that you've just mentioned uh, on your list. Uh, we've made progress, but for sure our work is still cut out for us because there's just so many women that we still have to get a seat at the table for. So good, let's talk about AI and uh, just uh, wonderful to join you in the audience today. You know, I believe, and at Microsoft, we believe that AI will become and is the defining technology of our time. And, and I'm extremely optimistic about what AI can do, will do for people, for industry, for society now in the future in ways that we are already seeing and not even yet being able to comprehend. So if you look across the world, we have many examples where AI is being used, for example, Today, the United States Department of Agriculture is leveraging AI to help make farming more sustainable, cost-effective for generations to come. We know that leading healthcare research institutions are working in collaboration with Microsoft's leading AI researchers just to accelerate the development of cancer treatments. And you know, when a, a small Brazilian startup wanted to help people get their car repairs done more easily, and when a South African nature conservation organization wanted to reduce rhino poaching, what did they do? They all turned to data and AI tools. Now data and AI tools and technologies are empowering people and institutions around the world to do things such as better understand their customers, share information more quickly and enable scientific breakthroughs. At Microsoft, we are also incorporating AI into many of our products. For example, in Microsoft 365, we have introduced tools for augmenting design and presentation and writing skills, as well as adding new security safeguards. When we think about AI, the ultimate goal is to create tools and technologies to augment the work that people do and freeing up their time for more creative tasks and innovative thinking, because we ultimately want to amplify human ingenuity. Our vision for AI is to empower every developer to innovate using our latest AI technologies. And we also want to empower organizations to transform entire industries using enterprise ready AI platforms and solutions. And ultimately, we believe that AI innovation has huge potential to transform not only business, but our society at large. But with the near limitless possibilities of AI, it can be hard to understand how exactly your organization can benefit from AI. AI is already one of the greatest commercial opportunities in today's fast changing economy. A recent study by PwC estimated that by 2030, AI could boost the global GDP by, by up to 14%, contributing almost $16 trillion to the global economy. Now with such enormous potential, it is therefore no surprise that enterprises across the globe are increasing their investments in AI. During the past two years, we have seen an acceleration in digital transformation with companies transforming twice as fast than before the pandemic. And AI is sitting at the heart of this transformation. And it has even become more of a priority than ever before. Now this brings us to the question for you as business leaders, and this is really the dilemma that all of us are facing today. And this is how we're going to ensure that, you know, our companies make AI part of the transformation. And how are we going to ensure that we ultimately leverage AI to its fullest potential in our business? 
Now, first, you must understand in your organization what's holding you back. Gartner estimates that nearly all enterprises will be leveraging AI in three years, but only a third have started or are planning to start their AI initiatives in the new term. Across the board, research tells us that businesses are eager to start using AI now, but they're facing key challenges related to strategy, execution, and techno technological implementation, which makes sense because businesses have a lot to consider when they think about how they're going to incorporate AI into their day-to-day -day activities. When asked about the, what are the challenges with adopting AI, executives across industries responded that they fear the unknown factors of AI and they had trouble finding a starting point, lacked a vendor strategy, and were concerned about the maturity of their enterprise. Now, AI leaders are tackling these challenges by driving understanding, creating acceptance, and also taking responsibility. According to a recent study by Forbes, the large majority of AI leaders have a complete grasp of the practical application of AI. And this is enabling them to think more holistically about what AI will mean for them within their organizations. Moreover, leaders are recognizing the need to transform culture and to gain buy-in from their employees. And they are communicating in ways that allow the employees to see the benefit and for them to accept AI with more you know, enthusiasm and a much greater exception, uh, acceptance. And finally, AI leaders also know that AI presents a wide range of ethical challenges. And to address concerns such as bias, and we always talk about it, AI leaders are establishing AI governance and following best practices for fostering trustworthy AI. But to become an AI leader in your industry, we believe that you need to focus on three things strategy, culture, and responsible AI. First, a clear strategy that defines how AI will be implemented into every application, every business process, and with every employee will become very empowering. Secondly, companies that successfully embrace AI need to openly share data across departments and business functions, making sure that all employees can participate in the development and the implementation of data-driven AI applications. This means that the company needs a data and AI-driven culture, one where employees feel comfortable with the role that AI plays in the business. Lastly, at Microsoft, we recognize that AI systems can be used for both you know, desirable and detrimental purposes, and that the users may have unintended consequences. And we think that Therefore, we must be realistic about the challenges that AI will raise. As AI systems get more sophisticated and start to play a larger role in people's lives, we believe it is imperative to develop and adopt clear principles that guide the people who are building, using, and applying AI systems. These principles should ensure that AI systems are at all times fair, reliable, safe, private, secure, inclusive, transparent, and accountable. This is what we mean by responsible AI. Thank you so much for listening to me today. And uh, I'm handing over back the virtual mic to you, Teresa. All right, we have one question for you that's come in, Lillian. And before I ask that question, I must also, you know, we've been acknowledging the important Black women in technology on whose shoulders we stand. And I just want to acknowledge um, Diane Young of IBM, who I know was a mentor of yours early in your career and who connected us with you to have you join us here today. So thank you for being here and thank you, Diane. You're welcome. No, absolutely, Diane. Diane played a pivotal role uh, in, my, in my career. And uh, I always say that, uh, you know, a lot of people are standing in the shape. Of course, she planted a tree a long time ago. Very good. Here's a question for you. Um, thank you for this presentation. This was very helpful, and especially for talking about the responsible AI. We have a question from our audience, which is that Microsoft has principles for responsible AI that draw on societal values. One such example of a societal value 
might be the South African value of Ubuntu that puts the group ahead of the individual. There are many more examples of societal values in Africa that are different from the rest of the world. As a global company with global products, how do you incorporate uniquely African values into your AI products that are delivered in here in Africa? That's a very interesting question, and I think also a very relevant one. And maybe let me just tell you kind of how we're approaching it at Microsoft. So our engineering teams right now are working on incorporating more African languages into Microsoft Translator. Now, what Translator aims to do, um, it breaks language barriers. That means that today, um, if you use Microsoft, someone can send you a, a, a text in a very different language. You press Translator and it will translate it into the language you need. But we do not have enough African languages, of course, in Translator. So what we're doing is that um, we've already started incorporating Swahili and other languages are to follow. And what's important about what we're doing here is to make sure that we are making the text as human translated as possible. And that is why we are partnering with communities to make sure that as we continue to build the bilingual data, uh, we consult with them so that we can ultimately deliver a quality output. So this is kind of one of the key things that we're focusing on. And we know that, you know, from a challenge point of view, it will be big in terms of making sure that we digitize enough, you know, African language to text. We also have to train computers, but this is one of the ways that we are, you know, using and focusing on making sure that we also make our tools relevant for the African content back to the, you know, the concept you, you've mentioned around Ubuntu. And I think it would be wonderful, you know, one day if we could have, you know, the many different languages that we have being translated um, by our Microsoft translator. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Lillian, and happy International Women's Day to you. Thank you, Teresa. We're going to move on to our next speaker now. And the next speaker we have is Amelia Biati. Amelia is the chief executive of Liberty Two Degrees, which is a property development and management company that is also part of the Standard Bank Group. So, um, Amelia, do we have Amelia here? Yes, I'm here. Fantastic. Hello, Amelia. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. And what a wonderful privilege to be in the company of all these amazing people today. Well, I, I feel the same way. And one of the things as I see your picture on the screen, I think I just have to give a plug for, we are developing a body of interviews um, called the listening tour of all of these women that are going to be freely available, deep interviews to acknowledge this history. No one has set out to record the history of the women leading big business in Africa today. And I've had the privilege of interviewing Amelia. So when I um, look at her on the screen today, I feel as if I know her and her life story. I know about her family. I know all about her own journey. And you will have the opportunity to know these things as well. Uh, we will be publishing that um, in a matter of months. So keep your eyes open. We'll be sending email when it goes live. We'll also be transcribing them. They'll be donated to the major business schools on the continent. And, um, and I think that it really is a, a special uh, set of insights into these women. We'll have just a few minutes with Amelia here today, but all of these women are participants in the listening tour. If you want to get to know them, understand them, and hear a very detailed account of how they made it to the top, then please come to the Africa.com listening tour. So with that, I look at my friend Amelia, and um, let's hear from you. We want to hear about how you are using AI within Liberty Two Degrees. Thank you so much, Theresa, and happy International Women's Day to everyone. I want to say this to every woman. You are enough, absolutely enough, to have a seat at the table and to fully occupy that. And I really want you to never forget that. So let's turn to the exciting topic of AI. There is no doubt that artificial intelligence has a vital role to play in today's decision-making processes in industries across the board, as we heard this afternoon. For us in retail, it makes a profound difference. In a world where data is created at an exponential rate from people coming into our malls, parking, spending, it is critical for us to extract the right signals from this data ahead of the competition, 
to make sure that we can make decisions faster than before. As the owners of iconic assets such as Sandton City, Eastgate Shopping Center, and I was very happy to see Sandton City as the second last image on your video today. Eastgate Shopping Center, Nelson Mandela Square, we constantly need to bring quality tenants into our malls to attract customers. And we need to bring in the right customers to support these tenants. We can't do this without the right insights and the right data to underpin our decisions. AI is key in helping us achieve our core goals to create value for our tenants, helping them thrive in our malls, design unique shopping experiences for customers in our malls, and deploy AI solutions to drive greater operational efficiencies and ensure safe and secure environments, which have become very important. Tens of millions of people walk in and out of our malls annually. This reflects the integral place that malls hold in the retail landscape. And you will hear me say this often, malls, super regionals, regional malls, they are not dead. They are very much alive. And the massive potential of data-driven insights waiting to be harnessed in these environments. We know that technology fueled disruptive innovations, changing preference, preferences of shoppers, and we are obsessed with that. We watch it every day. And online shopping is rapidly changing the way of traditional malls and creating new opportunities to transform the malls that we have into something more amazing every day. We continuously rethink technology our investments to support these business strategies to survive and thrive in this changing environment. We have recently installed some smart AI cameras at all our malls. And some of the key features of these cameras include for us foot count data, counting people. It's a papaya compliance solution or a personal information protection compliance solution. And it counts unique customers entering into the mall. It doesn't identify people's faces, so um, you remain uh, anonymous. So this information is anonymized, as I say, but it allows us to be able to use the movement of customers to gather, gather very rich insights on shopping journeys. And that helps us translate into store placements, adjacencies, where we put tenants, and how we change things around in our malls. Security management is absolutely essential in our environments, and our cameras can have object recognition solutions where they can detect potential weapons or identify unattended objects that are not part of the mall fixtures, and that way we can protect our customers. However, our solution is much more than merely an aid to ensuring our infrastructure is operating smoothly. It also gives us a much deeper understanding of potential challenges. So in the current tough, tough economic times where businesses of all sizes have been taking a lot of strain, it is imperative that we are able to give our tenants every possible advantage to retain existing customers and to attract new ones. We are very attuned to the evolving needs of our customers and these AI focused solutions within our malls provide us with these insights. They aid us in development uh, in developing long term strategies, while we can remain nimble enough to tweak and change things as they are required. For us, the future of retail is closely connected to embracing a very strong digital journey. And the introduction of AI for us is one step in this journey. Liberty Two Degrees, as Theresa said, is although we are independently listed, um, is part of the Standard Bank Group. And I will also share with you some of the work that the bank is doing and sending you very best wishes from Margaret Ninaber, the CEO of Client Solutions at the bank, who couldn't be here today. The Standard Bank Group is also undergoing a transformation from their current state as a financial services provider 
across Sub-Saharan Africa to achieve their 2025 ambition of becoming a platform business. They are building out from their solid foundation in traditional financial services to meet their clients where they are on the digital platforms where they are shopping, socializing and doing business. And there you can see how, connect, how connected banking and shopping are. Being part of a bigger ecosystem as a driver or contributor to coordinated networks of participants and devices, combining SPG's own offerings with those partners will enable their clients to fulfill a much broader range of needs seamlessly. The client solutions line of business enable the production of distribution of products more effectively through more channels on a much larger scale. And that is very important for the bank as they can do that also into Africa. The bank is committed to growing this new partnership to deliver both financial and non-financial complementary solutions in a digital way through open architecture and cost-effective solutions. SPG has also created a specialized innovation capability to generate and incubate new solutions and business models with speed and rigor, and AI plays a big role in that. The specialized innovation team promotes a culture of innovation across the bank. They provide expertise and skills to amplify and support that innovation, and importantly, pursue its own innovations, which should be disruptive using AI and focusing on completely new markets for the Standard Bank Group. So between the Standard Bank initiatives, which now also incorporates the insurance business of the Liberty Group as of the last week, and Liberty Two Degrees as iconic mall owners, we are doing incredibly exciting things. We intend to keep on accelerating the pace of disciplined and successful digital innovation using AI wherever we can. We will continue to create experiential spaces for future generations. And as we say in the bank, Africa is our home. We drive her growth. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. That was fantastic. And I think that um, many of us are surprised to learn how shopping centers are in on the AI game. When we realize through this session that you know, AI touches all aspects of our lives, you've certainly helped us to understand one that, that many wouldn't have appreciated. We understand that Microsoft is in that game, that uh, GE might be in that game, but to know that many of the people on this call have traveled to Johannesburg and walked into the Santon City Mall, not realizing that they were a part of that. So, so that's where one of the questions for you comes today. Um, the question from our audience is that, um, as, you, as you we're listening to you talk about how the smart cameras track visitors to the retail centers, it says throughout Africa, the mall is often a gathering place in a community where people go to see others and to be social, kind of like a town square. Um, what if I don't want to be treated like a customer? I just want to be treated as if I was going to hang out in the town square. Uh, what, I know you said that the, the data is anonymized, but what if I don't want to be tracked? What if I just want to be in the town square? Is it possible to opt out of these cameras and their tracking? Thank you. Um, I, you know, I think it's so wonderful to see, I stand in my office in Nelson Mandela Square and I look onto um, the, the square in front of it, which is very much like a town square, and I see people being back. And for the last two years, we've seen nobody. And it's wonderful to see how people really love that human connection coming back into these small environments and wanting to be there. And therein lies the answer to your question. So we anonymize um, the, the customer information that we use. So you might not want to be the person that are tracked and you will never be identified individually. But when you come to the town square, you want to be safe. You want to make sure that you can sit there and you don't have to worry about anything that is going to happen to you and that you come into an environment where you are looked after, cared for, where your wellness is, is taken care of. 
And that is really the big reason from a customer point of view that you want to know that that is what we do. We keep you safe with our cameras. And I think in an environment where we're all scared of many things and fear many things, to know that you can go to a place where your safety is our highest priority, I think that um, is worth knowing that these cameras are there. Well, very well said, Amelia. Thank you so much for sharing that knowledge with us. Very, very helpful contribution to today's conversation. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on to the third member of the Africa.com Definitive List CEOs, and that is Aida Diara, who is the head of Visa for Africa. Again, um, someone who I've had the privilege of interviewing as part of the listening tour. When it comes out, you'll want to hear her story as well. Um, and Aida, as I mentioned earlier, also has been involved in taking this work to the next level. She was part of our training of over a thousand young women early in their careers. And I hope that some of the women who are on with us today, who we don't know as well, will also join us for the training sessions that we're doing because we all wanna pay it forward, not just on International Women's Day, but I know all these women do and they mentor so many and using the benefit of, um, of technology, we can get that training and mentorship out there to, to, to thousands. So thank you, Ida, for all that you've done uh, with us as part of the listening tour speaking today and especially for helping us to train others. Or is, do we have Ida there? Yes, and I hope you can see me and hear me okay, Teresa. We can see you and hear you very well. Thank you and awesome. congratulations again for being part of the list. Thank you so much. And uh, it's really a privilege for me to be part of the list and to be part of the panel today. And uh, thank you for the opportunity and happy International Women's Day to all. Um, you know, what I'd like to do, and I've had, uh, you know, my uh, previous panelists talk about how artificial intelligence has been disruptive and uh, really creating new opportunity and transforming different industries. And I'd like to take the opportunity to talk about some of the trends that we see in payments, how Visa um, you know, has approached AI, and then what are the implications for institutions, organization in our, in our space. So you know, if we look at artificial intelligence, as I said, they are other underlying trends that sit uh, as a subcategory, which I'd like to talk about. The first one is about machine learning. And we've seen many companies adopt the technology to inform decisions on products and service development. And as the technology grows, we see a greater use of data science and algorithm to enhance the analysis of consumer information. And the objective here is to develop more streamlined and personalized customer experience. We see that as a disruptive trend and we've already seen billion dollar companies today that are being valued because of their capability to do algorithm. And I just want to share here an example of how we do this at Visa and how we leverage machine learnings. You know, we have what we call the Visa Smarter Stand-In Processing. We call it in our jargon, Smarter Steep. And what it is, is a capability that uses deep learning to analyze past transactions and generate informed decisions to approve or to decline a transaction on behalf of banks in the event that their system goes offline. And this is something that we've been implementing and creating opportunities both for customers and for banks as well. The second trend I wanna talk about here is the robotic process automation. That is more about introducing more complex systems that remove you know, the manual administration. And what it does is that it helps streamlines operations. And when you combine that with machine learnings, you are able to create extraordinary customer experience for your consumers. The third trend that I wanna talk about here is metaverse. Yes, metaverse. 
Um, this is something that a technology that we've seen in the gaming industry, yeah, a few years back. But what we've seen is that increasingly in our space, companies, banks are looking at how to leverage this capability and technology. So we've seen, for example, banks that are leveraging, you know, um, artificial reality in their app to create unique experiences to open an account, for example, and do other banking transactions. You even have a bank that is exploring um, what you call holographic workstation to create experiences for financial trading. And, you know, we're also looking at metaverse in a context of customer service and really see how we can leverage virtual brand uh, branches to create out of, um, you know, usual customer uh, service experiences. So critical trends to see there. And then the last one that I want to talk about that is so key, and I know Lillian has talked about it, and also Amelia, as I was looking at my notes, it's really the importance of data privacy and cybersecurity. Um, we often think about data as an asset, but it's also a massive liability, if not managed appropriately. Um, by design, you know, it's an emerging area for the wider industry. Um, and in many, many businesses, you know, we were forced to really take a second look about how we manage data privacy as we initiated new platforms and now we, as we launch new solutions. So if we reflect on uh, the foundation of the digital first approach for any organization, especially in our space, there are a few things we need to consider. The first thing that we've seen is we need to design for it in the first place. The data won't be there until you design for it. And without a data first approach, you will be experiencing challenges down the line. So that's the first thing. Data is cru crucial. And without it, it is more, challenges to, more challenging to make improvements to the customer service experience. And what we've seen you know, in our industry is that new banks that have built you know, data, data science and artificial intelligence in their operations from the get-go have been able to offer unique experiences and unique solutions to their customers through a wide range of personalized services. So food for thoughts you know, for the rest of the industry. We also need to think about artificial intelligence differently when it comes to financial inclusion, which is a priority for all regulators across the continent. AI, I believe, can be a catalyst for financial you know, uh, inclusion, provided that we leverage it you know, with responsibility to help many in the area of KYC, which is know your customer verification process. You know, it will allow to leverage capabilities like, you know, facial recognition. Um, we also have the possibility to leverage, you know, the phone usage, the phone top up to really understand the behavior of customers and define value proposition that is, you know, specific to their own needs. By 2025, the revenue from AI is projected to reach $36 billion globally. And it is about for each and every one company to build the capability internally to manage these assets and this technology efficiently. For Visa, you know, we've created the Data Council that really acts as a, act as a strategic brain for us, making sure that, you know, we are careful about the, the use cases and what we're going after. We're also having a data use council that evaluate, you know, the, news, you know, the new use cases and make sure that we have the proper governance around it. And, you know, we have found that this structure have helped us 
be a little bit more nimble, a little bit more agile, and be innovative in that space while being responsible. Yeah. And the last point I will mention is about investing in infrastructure. Um, it is key. Um, we're looking at in F2022 to F2023, more at more than $500 billion worth of investment in AI infrastructure across the globe. Yeah. And that's why internally at Visa, we have you know, prompted Visa technologies to build an in-house platform to power complex decisions to ensure that we would provide you know, second to none consumer experience. So artificial intelligence is here to stay, Teresa. Um, you know, the data has been proclaimed now to be the, the world's most valuable resource and as companies, we need to commit to strong governance, ethics, and culture around AI. Uh, and it's going to be valuable for Sub-Saharan Africa more than anywhere else. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ida. Very helpful, very relevant sector for everybody who's ever used a debit or credit card. Um, so thank you. One of the questions that we have is coming in from Nigeria. And the question that we have is, AI in the payment space is being used to detect fraud. How do we balance the value of AI and its real knowledge, for example, of where fraud comes from on the one hand, and the reality on the other hand, that that information is biased, perhaps rightly so, but biased. So for example, I am Nigerian and I'm thinking how Nigeria gets the short end of the stick when it comes to these matters. I'm often not allowed to use my credit card on global websites because of the higher than average level of credit card fraud coming from my country. How do you balance this? Thank you, Teresa, for, for the question. And I think that my last comment around, you know, the use of AI to drive financial inclusion and to better understand consumer behavior will really serve to address you know, the uh, pain point highlighted in your question. It's really about leveraging the data, leveraging the consumer behavior and fine tuning our understanding of consumer you know, uh, uh, behavior and transactions that we will be able to pinpoint that the fact that even if a transaction is made from a credit card, out of Nigeria, it is a legitimate uh, transaction because we've had the opportunity to leverage different da data points and confirm that the transaction is legitimate. So it's, if anything, it's more artificial intelligence that will help us alleviate some of the challenges that we may be observing today. I think you're right. I mean, I think about my experience doing e-commerce across the continent, and I can remember being in Nigeria or South Africa and going to certain global websites, and they just blocked the entire IP address from an entire country. And you just couldn't, let alone buy anything. You're not even, you weren't even allowed to look. And so I think having a better understanding, as you say, takes away in some ways, you know, some of the biases just saying we don't want any customers from Nigeria at all because they're in all fraudulent to saying, okay, we're going to manage this better and let Nigerian customers come and then use the AI to differentiate. Absolutely. Could not agree more. Wonderful. Thank you, Aida. Always a privilege. Congratulations for being on our list and thank you for the contributions that you continue to make. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. All right, we're going to move on to Helene Echevin. Um, I'm particularly happy that Helene is here today um, representing the healthcare sector. Um, interesting, when we did the data to see, we, we mine data here at Africa.com, maybe not quite AI, but I, I look at the charts that uh, our team produces, and we had registration data today to see what sectors people come from, and the number one sector was financial services, the number two sector was healthcare, and so, Helene, you now are going to have to carry the healthcare ball for the entire session, because all these people on the call in the healthcare sector um, have been waiting to hear from you. So please let us turn, the, uh, turn it over to you to tell us how CL has been using um, AI in its business in the healthcare sector. 
Well, thank you, and, and, and thank you, Teresa, and the, the entire team of Africa.com for organizing this event on this special day today. Um, I'm very pleased to be with you, and you put a lot of pressure on me, saying that I will be the healthcare person <laughs> talking. Um, maybe I have had a, a, a presentation, if your team can just put it on, on, on the screen. Um, in fact, uh, I work for a group, Ciel, which is a, a Mauritian group, uh, but quite diversified in different clusters, uh, agro, finance, hotel and resorts, healthcare, property, textile. And why I thought it was interesting to talk about it, it's because in AI, size matters and we are in our area, a reasonable size group, but when I compare to my previous colleagues, we remade, I would say, kind of mid. And this is very important from an AI perspective. Now, if I go to the next slide, what would be more my scope of responsibility? As you can see, we are in Mauritius, we are in Uganda, and we are providing healthcare. So we would assist 350,000 patients yearly, um, but again, size matters. So why I'm saying that, it's because for a group like us to really make a change through the AI, we can't do it by ourselves. We need to partner and we need to really join forces with, with others. So in our sector, if we go to the next slide, what can we do as a healthcare sector in, in the sector of AI? I would say first, I mean, obviously there's many, many usage, but the first one would be about the remote health assistance, about all these algorithms to, be, to allow patient first to pre-screen and orient themselves on what do they really have? So having all those um, data capturing, helping the patient to answer kind of checklist to really help them to say, oh, I should go to see this kind of specialist or I should go to this kind of provider. So from a patient perspective, it can really help them to better understand what they have. From a provider perspective, for example, we are provider perspective. Um, it can really help us to uh, do some telehealth, especially in our case, in very remote area, where in Uganda, for example, we will be located sometime very far away from Kampala because we have a network of, of clinics, primary care center, and access to remote uh, human resources, to clinical staff, uh, to clinical expertise in those areas is very difficult. Very difficult because the people don't want to go there or the occurrence of a sp very specific um, uh, pathology might be very rare. So in that case, with all the, I would say, data and AI, the fact that we can map uh, different kinds of scenarios, it really can assist um, and skills or I would say less skilled clinical staff on the ground to be able to assist where the, the patient will need it. Obviously, all the Internet of Things, we are trying more and more today to connect, for example, in our remote clinics, devices to be able to get the data from our main hospital where we have more people and more expertise to be able to assist. So this will be, I would say, in our countries um, where AI is really a help in the kind of helping remotely. The second aspect will be around um, the preventive healthcare versus curative healthcare. So how can we cross check, uh, be it from a family perspective, from a region perspective, from a co-pathologies perspective, how can we anticipate in healthcare uh, what would be um, the pathology of tomorrow, of the next two years or five years by 
I would say uh, all the algorithm taking all the past studies uh, uh, around patients. So um, this is obviously another sector which uh, is really helping, um, uh, I would say, the, the provider, but also mainly, I would say, the health insurance uh, to anticipate and, and uh, try to uh, uh, predict uh, future, future risk. Then uh, there's also the, the, the AI where the, it can be used in our, in our sector would be about the accuracy of the diagnostic. In uh, our case, for example, we are in Mauritius and in Uganda where it, it remains quite, I would say, small compared to the rest of the world. And we will be using um, images or trying to get um, images to be pre-read by uh, algorithm to be able to detect from a CT scan, from an MRI, what is it uh, behind? Therefore, again, uh, if we don't have the right specialist or the very technicality or very rare problem, it will be assisted through uh, uh, AR on those uh, images. So now today we have a system that can bring uh, send all the images uh, in many different centers around the world. On the histopathology also, so I don't know if you are, uh, everyone understands, but uh, when you want to, to analyze a piece of, of tissue, um, today there's, um, uh, I would say the traditional way of doing it is to put it in a kind of a, um, of a block and then you will slide it, you will put it under a microscope and someone will read it. And here again, in very specific cancer treatment or very, very rare cases, uh, the people don't know. So same as the CT scan or the MRI, for example, uh, we have in our case digital, digital scanners. So now we can like take pictures of those, um, of those blocks, of those histopathology, those images, and get a screening and algorithm that helps to um, uh, pre read um, the, the report. So I would say globally today, um, uh, this is where uh, in our case, we are, we are going through uh, our own challenges are being either uh, a small uh, country or a small occurrence place or in Uganda, with very remote uh, 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 care facilities where uh, access to human rec uh, resources is, is difficult. Having said that, um, there's challenges. And if we can go maybe on the next slide. First, obviously, as many of, um, of, of our colleagues have said about the mindset, AI is about data. Data is about capturing those data. And in um, our world, we don't know all the time uh, uh, what are the causes. Uh, and, and we are pushing our staff and our people and the doctors to, to put, to, to, to really record everything. But they don't like to, in fact. Um, uh, I had once uh, one of the CEO of one of the hospitals telling me, Ellen, if, I have, if a doctor has chosen that job, if a nurse has chosen to be a nurse, it's not to be behind a computer. She doesn't want to be logging data all day long. So when you are pushing your people to be really uh, behind um, the data capturing and things like that, it's, it's bringing them I would say far from the patient and from a patient perspective and from a staff perspective, they want those traditional kind of healthcare um, uh, uh, assistance. So we need to find means uh, to really accelerate how to capture uh, all those data um, uh, around the patient history. Obviously, as our all uh, my colleagues said, uh, we are also in a very sensitive uh, 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 sector where the data protection and data sharing is a challenge. Uh, to whom this data belongs to, obviously to the patient, but sometimes a bit to the doctor also. Sometimes doctors won't share the data. So how do you? use those data and, and really, uh, I would say, uh, make the most of it if you don't have the authorization of the patient or the willingness of the doctor to really share everything. 
And then I would say maybe in our context, um, uh, recently we have been really diverted in a way by the, 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 the COVID uh, situation. So it's also about the focus, our ability to invest time uh, into the subject of uh, uh, data crunching. And uh, where on one side, I would say COVID-19 has been a very positive acceleration uh, on all those aspects of telehealth, remote access. It has also been a kind of defocus and uh, have been put everyone back on very traditional life support uh, 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 problematics. So uh, this for, for us, at least for me as the CEO of CL Healthcare, um, I think we have been, in fact, losing a few years in our uh, uh, digital transformation and AI transformation. So definitely um, in our sector, there would be uh, a huge impact in how to prevent, how to reduce cost of treatment by using AI. But for organizations uh, uh, like ours, uh, I need to, to admit that the number of data that we have compared to the rest of the world remains very limited. And by doing it ourselves only won't be possible. So we should have all the different providers teaming, joining forces so that we can bring all those data together to really make a difference. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Helene. And I think it's fantastic, your perspective, because we have, you know, all of the other CEOs are coming from very large global corporations. And it's important to get the perspective because most of the world is not large corporations. Most of the organizations are medium or smaller and smaller than yours. So understanding that, um, that point that you make is really critical. Um, so please don't apologize. We thank you for bringing us that, that view. Um, and I think to that end, one of the questions that came in, I think, touches on this. And, and one of the questions that we have from our audience is that one of the exciting things about AI in healthcare is the ability to identify trends among certain groups in order to come up with personalized medicine. But the ability to do so is only as good as the data being analyzed. Are you using data from the respective African countries like Uganda, where you operate, to drive your algorithms? Or is your data coming from elsewhere in the world? Yeah. So to... Again, to be very candid, um, uh, we are, I would say, at the beginning of our journey in our case. Uh, we are the biggest uh, East African, I would say, uh, primary care provider. So we own a lot of data. Um, having said that, what we have started is to go and meet, um, uh, 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 I would say, partners to say, come up, let's work together because we are treating our patient on, on a day to day from a very traditional way of treating patient. And you have uh, the mindset and the technology. And for example, in Uganda, we are very strong on uh, HIV. We are very strong on malaria because we are seeing so many patients. So we went to some research company saying, we need to do something. We need to use these data to really come up with with, with trends, with, with um, ideas of how to treat our patient better at a lower case, the cost, because I think this is also uh, the challenge and the objective. So for the time being, I would really say that we are at the beginning of the journey and our way of tackling it is to go and look for partners saying, come with us, let's, let's join forces, we'll be stronger by putting, um, I would say, everything together in terms of data crunching. Fantastic. Well, such an important use of AI, one that we can all appreciate and clearly benefit from. And so we thank you for the important work that you're doing in the healthcare sector, serving Africans. We know this is a gr grossly underserved sector on the continent and the work that you're doing is bringing more care to where it's very much needed. So thank you so much and congratulations for being part of our list. And we, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you to all the team. All right. And now we're going to conclude with Brenda Mbati, who is the CEO of GE East Africa. Brenda, thank you so much for being with us. Congratulations for being part of the Africa.com definitive list of women CEOs. And we are looking forward to hearing about how GE is using AI. Over to you. Thank you so much, Teresa, and happy Women's Day to everyone. 
So GE, we focus on building a world that works. We have three main businesses. We have GE Healthcare, um, and at the center of GE Healthcare is an ecosystem that strives for precision health, and we build intelligent devices, and it was great to hear speakers before me, Helene, you know, touched on it. Um, we build intelligent devices, we use data analytics, applications and services to enable healthcare practitioners to deliver care more efficiently and with better outcomes. We then have our energy portfolio and our energy portfolio encompasses just our power business and our renewables business, which includes hydro, grid, wind and digital. And um, here we look to create the energy technologies of the future and improve power networks that we all depend on today. GE powers a third of the world's electricity today. And together with our customers, we also provide access to affordable, reliable and sustainable energy. And finally, our business, GE Aviation, which is a driving force for flight. And we're looking at the future of flight in the future, definitely using AI and GE Aviation is a world leading provider of aircraft engines, systems and avionics. So what do we do with artificial intelligence? At GE, artificial intelligence is focused on connecting mines and industrial machines to enable intelligent and user friendly products and services that through our three businesses that I mentioned, we move, cure and power the world. And we do this by using AI solutions that execute on industrial devices, large industrial machines using edge or in the cloud. And we look to create state of the art perception and reasoning capabilities with AI technology to observe and understand contextual meanings so that we improve the performance and life of our assets. Those are the large machines that we have, industrial systems and indeed human health. We are constantly looking to develop learning systems that will teach and learn from other assets or agents. And we actually learn from real and virtual experiences so that we understand and improve behavior. And all, our, all the speakers before me touched on this as well. With artificial intelligence, we use our capabilities in what we call computer vision, machine learning, knowledge representation, reasoning, and human systems interactions, what people know in the AI world as HSI, so that we can robustly monitor, assess, and predict the performance and health of assets. Again, the machines that we have, the equipment we have. And this we use, and we get information that ultimately provides the information needed to improve the metrics. And so this is essential as we continuously innovate in the equipment that we look to build. So what are the benefits and the challenges? Well, there's some benefits. And with this, we look at the examples of customer outcomes, which are enhanced by using AI products. And Helene touched on this earlier. We have reduced downtime on assets through AI-driven proactive intervention. We look at preventive care. So in terms of diagnostics for oncology, that indeed has been mentioned earlier. In the aviation space, we look at looking using AI to prevent airline delays and cancellations. And we also look at how we can improve the assets and the throughput, i.e. through the control of wind turbines, ETC, ETC, and optimal, optimize our power plants that are installed all over the world. So we look to develop and integrate artificial intelligence in healthcare as well, which is, as you said, most of the um, listeners today are from the healthcare space. So we look to incorporate this technology into every aspect of the patient journey, looking at improved disease diagnos diagnosis, augmenting doctors and clinicians. And again, we heard that doctors and clinicians don't want to stay behind computers inputting data. So we try to assist them by the equipment that they're actually using. So we look to improve efficiency to save precious time, which is very important for the healthcare workforce. But indeed, there's some challenges and key challenges. And we heard earlier was the issue of the lack of sufficient labels. We don't have enough data, maybe. And we also need to look at our traditional learning approaches, how we need to modernize. And then how do we ingest and how do we link all the data that we get? 
And then we use these AI solutions so that we can interpret them and use them, but always being mindful of the governance and the safety reg related regulatory requirements, which we find in all the businesses that we're involved in. I want to give you an example from GE Healthcare. So how do we use AI to create solutions? The COVID pandemic exposed the fragility of the global healthcare system. And this created an urgent need for technology and solutions that would help clinicians manage seriously ill COVID-19 patients and other advanced diseases such as cancer and heart disease. And there was such a backlog in non-urgent care because people were battling COVID-19 and also the healthcare workforce was battling work, burnout and shortages of, of the workforce. So we used AI to look to improved and increased efficiency and productivity through software enhancement. This was to help reduce clinician burnout and to also provide the clinicians with AI and analytics where and when they needed it using what we know in GE as our Edison platform thus creating a more resilient and sustainable healthcare industry and also increasing access to care. And so we did this at the time of COVID and it actually helped us to leapfrog and to spearhead new technologies and solutions. So we developed AI powered automated and data driven solutions to help encourage greater diagnostic confidence and again, ease the burden of care and improve the workflow for the healthcare workforce. And so what makes AI research or the use of AI, which actually has been around for decades, more exciting? So one reason is that we now have a huge amount of data available to us. And we also have a huge amount of computing power. And so we see more applications where AI is becoming more of a living system, where it's more about continuous learning. We see significant performance increases where you have a human in the loop, part of the AI's experience, allowing us to correct the systems. But once you build a smooth user experience and get the system going, people actually don't realize they're actually using AI or they're cor correcting AI along their experience. So at GE, when we look at our manufacturing and services, we know that an AI system can provide employees with the intelligence they need to make informed decisions. So for instance, with our field service engineers, which who are on top of a huge wind turbine, they will know to use AI allows them to understand, should they repair this turbine or should we scrap it? But ultimately we are still using humans to make the final call and we're using their expertise. So in this case, I said her and his, because being Women's Day, we tend to say his and hers. So just wanted to call out that bias. And then, you know, in the next few years, it's all very exciting, but things are going to evolve. And that human experience is also going to evolve. And we're going to start moving on to machines, which will be so intelligent that they will start collaborating amongst themselves and optimizing things. And that indeed is what's going on currently at our GE research labs, which are looking at imagination at work and using AI to drive this. Thank you, Teresa. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Brenda. That was a wonderful presentation. And you certainly have a lot of depth. There's a lot of work going on in AI at GE for you to share with us. Um, coming back to the healthcare piece, which seems to have a lot of interest in our audience. Um, we know that, uh, GE is using AI to read x-rays. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and just helping the lay person understand how GE is using this AI in just kind of everyday concepts that we, we can understand from a healthcare perspective? Thank you. And you know, I want to also thank Helene who spoke before me because she touched on this a little about how it's so important for radiology and for x-rays to be read. So when a patient's x-ray is taken, the minutes and hours it takes to process and interpret this image actually impacts the outcome for a patient in either direction. It can be good or bad. But now we have AI, we've improved technology so that we can speed up the diagnosis. And this is very important. Even with oncology, you can go and get your diagnostics and you can wait for the result rather than have to go home and come back. And this is really important when you're thinking about being empathetic and managing the the healthcare experience, the patient experience, what is important. 
And this changes the way we care for patients and ultimately can save lives and improve outcomes. So during the COVID pandemic, we managed to, as I said, increase and improve the technology with different what we would call critical care suites. And we've allowed, we've been able to do this using AI intelligence and analytics. And we've been able to now put in and install software upgrades without moving the equipment and allowing us to just upgrade the equipment and the experience. And this has been a significant advancement in delivering solutions to various customers, especially in Africa. We now don't need to have as many bulky pieces of equipment in healthcare. We now use more handheld devices, which are more readily available to use in more remote places, which we all know exist in the countries where we operate. And so by doing this and embracing this important step, which indeed received regulatory approval, we're now closer to embracing AI as part of today's you know, standard of delivering healthcare to all our patients and to the clinicians. And once again, it's really important what Helene touched on about making it a pleasant user experience for the clinician so that they can ultimately provide the best care to the patients, which is ultimately what we're looking at. Fantastic, oh, fantastic. Thank you for helping us understand that a little bit better. We really appreciate that. And thank you for bringing all of your knowledge and expertise to this conversation, Brenda. We really welcome you into our world of, of women CEOs and um, you've just been a fantastic contributor to this discussion and thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa. Okay, well, we have had a whirlwind tour of what women CEOs in Africa need to know about artificial intelligence. I can tell you, I've learned a tremendous amount today. I hope that all of you have done so as well. Um, I really, again, I've said it several times, but I wanna make sure that I say it again, none of this would have been possible without Karim Lakani, who has been an extraordinary partner in this endeavor. Um, he has many things going on. We'll be announcing something big that we can't announce today. You should follow him on Twitter. <laughs> follow him on Twitter and you will be seeing some very exciting things coming out from, from what he's doing. And, and amidst all of that, he has made International Women's Day for Africa a real priority. And, um, and has put it on his very too busy to-do list. He's never said, I've got too much going on, I can't be a part of this. It's quite the opposite. He's been driving the driving force behind the success I think that we've had today. So one more time, I'd like to thank Karen Lakani. Um, I hope you will also indulge me in, in allowing me to thank my tremendous team members at Africa.com. I think many of you know their names. Um, Laura Joseph, our managing director, who has been managing all the relationships with all of the speakers and, and so many aspects of this. Um, Deborah Winter, who comes in on the operations and creative side, oversaw all the very dynamic video presentations that were made today. Um, Nilka Terrablanche, who is overseeing the research effort that drove the women. She does the primary analysis. Um, on the data that's provided by Bloomberg in order to get to our list of women CEOs. We have Susan and Nelly who are based out of Kenya and our journalists who help us with everything from managing the website to managing our social media. Sean out of South Africa, who is also help us, helping us to manage this event and also uh, does a lot of editorial work on the site. Um, that's a core group, we have more than that, but that group of, um, of six people have been really instrumental at Africa.com in bringing this session together today, which I think has been the most ambitious um, undertaking we have had since we started these webinars um, with the number of speakers, the breadth, the range of collateral that's been produced, um, having videos and, and so many different ways of presenting information today. I'm proud of what our team has produced and I hope that we've been able to contribute to the knowledge of everybody on this call. Uh, wishing everyone a very happy International Women's Day. And last and certainly not least, I want to acknowledge the sponsors who have made this possible. Um, that is our presenting partner, Standard Bank, who is always with us 
Um, they are fantastic thought leadership partners who challenge us, who think with us, who help us deliver this content. Um, they care beyond our audience. They also want their staff to be a part of it. So we thank them for bringing their staff into this. Thank you to all the people of Standard Bank who've been part of developing it and consuming it today. And as well, our title partner, Visa, as you've heard, as you've heard, led by Ida Diaria, who isn't just a sponsor of this work today, but has given her time to educate our audience and help the next generation of young women who aspire to become corporate CEOs. Um, been very helpful in donating time, thought leadership, um, and sponsorship. So we're grateful to all of these without whom today would have, wouldn't have been possible. Thank you all. Please share this information, share the link. This will be available on video on demand. Share it on your social. We want as many people to benefit from this wealth and treasure trove of knowledge as possible. With that, it's a wrap. Thank you very much.